Hello, everybody. Let's see. Is this working? Is this working? It is working. And it's I've got live chat running. Wonders will never cease. Hello, everyone. How are we doing? <coughs> Hello. Let's see. Abelsaski. Hello. Peter Dawson. Hello. Blackburn. Blackburn. Hello. Pension. Hello. <coughs> I will observe your struck. Oh, good lord. Uh, Timu Luka. Hello. Good lord. There's a lot from Bijan and Blackburn. Blackburn tonight. I I'm not sure which one of you probably needs the the medication. Um, hello, John Shea. Hello, DGV40. How are you all doing? <laughs> hello, everyone. Oh, I don't know. How is it all going? Analytics are coming in, and currently I have 11 concurrent viewers, according to this system. Not sure if it's how well it's working, but you know. Hey ho, we never know. We never know how well any of these things are working. Uh, it was supposed to be 6.30 tonight, so I'm presuming it's live. It's supposed to be. Hello, everyone. Uh, hello, Zachary Gherkin. Hello, Carl Gersberg. You have Jet Engine running in there. I shouldn't do. This is supposed to block it. Give me a second. Hello. Da, 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 da. Why is it? Ah, uh, yes, it was trying to pick up the sound from the microphone for some reason. I have no idea why. Uh, da, 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 da. Let me just sort out that one. Hopefully that's better. Hopefully there's no jet engine sound now. I've almost got halfway of the Sink the Bismarck beer from Brewdog. Well, well, that's a good start. Admittedly, I don't drink it, but I've always heard good things about it. <coughs> hello, Roland Cash. I love the t-shirt, Dr. Locke. Um, hello, everyone. Yes. Now, the reason I'm wearing the t-shirt is, as you'll notice in other videos, is because I am talking quickly about the competition I have a little going, a little sort of bet I have going with my aunt about reaching... 13,000 subscribers by December the 31st, and if I do so, then she and my uncle will take a picture of them both wearing Blackburn Blackburn face masks. So, I need your help. If I'm going to get anywhere near there, I need your help. So please, help. Thank you. And let's see, just check everything's okay on here. We are joined by a fluffy research assistant, but at the moment he's currently being quite... How do I put this politely? Snoozy. But that might change at a moment's notice. Hello, Vayner to Grand Prize. Hello, Dan Friedman. Hello, Carl, and Carl Van Gersberg. After several minutes for, uh, watching for several minutes, YouTube sent a notification about Dr. Clark is live. Well, that's always good when it eventually sends out notification. Jet engines are anathema to the glorious biplane. I'm not sure where the jet engine's coming from. The thing doesn't feel that hot. And nothing is blocked, as far as I can tell. In fact, my laptop is actually raised up. So, yes, we never learn much about Canaris in history class. I'm afraid that's because there isn't really much, uh, there isn't much about there to learn. And it's, the thing is, and I'm going to address this to starters, there have been quite a few people coming back commenting on the Donuts video that I'm being a bit harsh on him. And if he stood up, he'd have got himself killed and all sorts of things. The thing is, there are officers who stand up and some of them do get themselves killed, some of them don't. But there are even officers who stand up in Japan, and I'm going to be covering one of those officers a little bit at the end today. And I've done a live about, a recorded long patrol about this officer, which is going to be out on the 22nd. Because he really did stand up. 
And this is the point. I suppose, to an extent, I expect naval officers to stand up. Maybe that's my own prejudices showing. But Canaris, as much as he drank the Kool-Aid, and yeah, he tried to reason with people, and when that didn't work, he did what he always did. He plotted. Who knows what he'd achieved if he'd had the help of Donuts. Raider certainly seems to have... How do I put this? Raider never seems to be involved in these things against Hitler, but it's amazing how much equipment gets used by some of the people which should be spotted by Raider, but he manages to not see. It's almost as if perhaps someone does keep him in the loop, but he doesn't get involved. But there's no proof of that, and frankly, Radar is his own fanciful thing. He really is. Donuts. Yeah. Anyway, I'm starting off with this whole thing up my, on my shoulder. A thankless task or potential for greatness, because Donuts is the key one I'm using as the live and the discussion for the live, and I'll, I will do a response to comments, etc. Probably video it start come through at some point in you know end of September maybe on the end of October beginning of October and there is a white noise I have no idea why there is a white noise but let me turn that down a bit um there shouldn't be. There's no white noise registering on my system. As I said, there's... Uh... Alright then. Okay. So that's better. Hopefully any white noise has been dealt with at this point. Uh, as you can probably guess, what's happened is it had managed to turn off the suppression gates. So hopefully that's got rid of any white noise. Donuts. <clears throat> but, and I think, hello Anuk, hello Seneca Nero, hello Roland Cash, Juicy Susan, Graham Highlander, um, Donitz, like Spear, was somewhat lucky to not, uh, to not have had his neck elongated. Very lucky. Blackburn, you wrote, One reason why Canaris didn't spoke about it is because while he plotted against Hitler, he was still Nazi. Yes. I, I, I Again, I, you can't change that fact about Canaris. But I would say he's also less enamoured than most with the Nazi project. He is... I would say Canaris is far... He does join up the Nazis as far as he sees that as German patriotism. But some of the other things he does, especially the protections he does of um, Jewish origin agents, etc. Uh, I, I, I would not say... I would say he's in the grey area of history. And I think that's the important point. Once you're at the sort of level which I try and set these videos at and at the level of, you know, university level history, or when you're discussing history, you have to be prepared to go into the grey areas. You have to be prepared for there not to be a binary good, bad, yes or no. There are people who are bad, and there are people who are good. But, no one, people who are good are rarely purely good. And people who are bad, there are a few exceptions, possibly, who are ever purely bad. I.e. absolute evil person, but nice to, their fa nice to small children and their family for some reason. Still evil. Still bad. Still nasty. But the thing is, that doesn't even make them a nice person. And noticing that doesn't make them. 
Canaris, I had, as you've said, seen in those videos, I've been very careful. At no point do I say these people are good people. Most of them are not. There are a couple of exceptions who I do say. I think, broadly speaking, on the good side of history. And there is one who I go so far as to say, actually, all the rest we talk about being samurai and samurai for Hirohito and this sort of thing. This one actually does sort of sort of accord with the samurai ideals, to an extent. But the thing is with Canaris, and I, this is supposed to is mainly about Donuts, but it's going to cover all the admirals we've discussed so far and I've brought up so far, and even a couple of who I haven't brought up so far. The main thing about Canaris, you have to remember, is he is a man who lives in the shadows. That is his world. He is utterly patriotic. He utterly believes in Germany. He's utterly devastated by the end of World War I. He signs up to the Nazi war effort. He does do sort of, I said all the things. But the moment he finds them doing extermination camps and those sort of things, that's beyond his line. So, he's not a good person, but he has a moral line and it stops short of, uh, it seems to stop short of killing, of mass murder and genocide. That seems to be at the point at which he draws the line. And then he tries to stop people. And then he starts to do his best. And again, that, he, he, he's still committed to Germany. This is the thing. Would he have accepted Germany without the Nazi party? Probably. Wouldn't have bothered him. Because it wasn't about the Nazi party, it was about Germany for Canaris. Where, and it's about Germany for Raider. For Donitz, it is about the Nazi party. He's as close as you can get to some of the Italian admirals who are appointed who do drink the Kool-Aid. And I mean drink it, bathe in it, dive through it. Ron Cash, yes, a bit of hitting, but you just executed like a prisoner in Spain now. Hmm, no, it's gone. Ah, I'm glad it's gone. Yeah, there was, for some reason the thing had turned off, and I hope it's not in all the videos earlier, recorded earlier. Um, probably not. Moon Cox, the words... There are, that's why I never said those words. I don't say good Nazi. There is no such... Fit. Yeah, there are people who go along with uh, again, as I said, when I'm explaining about Can Canaris, he is a nuanced figure. Um, just even, the way you keep saying Donuts makes me wonder if he's a Venerian, Venerian cream or fritter. I don't know. I have to say, I probably should pronounce his name better after years of people trying to teach me, but um. I tend to pronounce it how it's spelt, mainly because of years of trying to teach students how to spell it. Darren just got chucked off the live stream on my TV. What did you do to your TV? Um, there was actually an interesting comment where someone said that Canaris reminded them of the guy from Game of Thrones, the Master of Whispers. And apart from being very um, prudish and Prussian, there is a certain similarity in that what he's looking for is a great Germany. Or uh, like that guy, gentleman it seems to be always seeking a great nation, a great sort of king to rule benevolently. Canaris is seeking a great Germany. He doesn't care what the vehicle is. He cares about the great Germany. And he's prepared to tolerate a lot if it's a great if if he thinks it'll bring to a great Germany. William Cox. A lot of good can be said about Yamashita. He was a company man, and in the end served his purpose. Um hmm. Brilliant long. Do you think Donuts being sent to ten in Spanner for ten years was justified? 
I think it was lucky they didn't manage to make any of the wars against human the crimes against humanity stick. I think they could have done if they'd done some more digging, but they didn't want to for some reason. So he got ten years, and that's not that bad. And honestly, he gets ten years for mainly for the excesses, because yes. Everyone, and I've written this, everyone does summary warfare to a lesser or greater extent. But, Donets, love him or hate him, you have to admit he does push his submarines to a bit of an extreme. And he does jump up the rules a bit. And he's in charge. And unlike Raider, he becomes head of state. So, the fact he only gets 10 years is probably very lucky for him. Ron Cash, a lot of people who joined Nazi post um, Putsch era were just operating in the realm of real uh, of uh, real politic. Um, I'd say post nineteen thirty five are operating in real politic. Post putsch is a bit early, but I can understand why you're saying that. But you have to remember, Donitz doesn't wait around for that long. I agree, but the majority of popular history is presented as a much more basic level. Presenting a Canaris as a sympathetic character would be problematic for most documentaries. True. But this is the point. This is the advantage of YouTube history. I can present it as a, as I would a university class, and then I can deal with the probably fallout from YouTube afterwards. Hmm. Ron Cash. Um, um, history is made of layers. Good and evil is the final coat, or... At least, way, at least way after the printer and the, uh, the first coat. Primer and first coat. Good on the ear. I would say... If you consider history as a pyramid, and you start from the top, the smallest point, which is the most simple point, that's where you get good and evil. But as it goes down and down and down and down, down, that's where you get the nuance coming in, and the context and the information. And you sort of realise that good and evil are these sort of extreme bits on the edges, the surface of the pyramid. All the stuff in between is the spectrum of grey. And the nicest way, there were some people on the Allied side. We keep talking about the Soviets, but not just on the Soviets. We're talking some British and American officers who what they do is not nice. Bomber Harris and Dresden. There are issues there. Not when someone says stands up and goes, that should be does that mean the bomber cruise? It doesn't mean the bomber cruise, because in the nicest way, when you're dealing with crimes at that level, the bomber crews are just doing what they're all told to do. You have to talk about the officers who give the order to go to. Not the officers who plan it, not the officers who I think you have to talk about the plan of people who go. But the trouble is if you want to do that, you then also got to go up to the people who are going to order it. Which has got to be Eisenhower, Churchill, all the levels up above of Harris and above have got to stand because anyone who signs off on that is involved. So this is the reality of war. It's not nice. And if you think of people as just good and bad, with exceptions of Hitler, who frankly probably deserves it, and you know, does deserve it, you are missing out on a lot of the information and the context and understanding you can learn from history. Uh, a good example, I think it was the amount of people who could turn around and when you use class and go, so who in here would be a Nazi, uh, who in here would join the Nazi party if they were in Germany in the 1930s? And usually most of the class says no. And you sit there and go, well, that's wrong. The odds are most of you would have done. I usually start off with, we're in the 1930s, we live in the 1930s. 
purview in here is sort of this, that, and, you know, and try and work it through them. You have to try and do it as sensitively as you can. You always do it warning and say, look, I'm going to be doing this exercise. It's about 1930s Germany. If you're going to be find it distressing, please don't dress it. Uh, please, you know, come to a different, uh, go to a different seminar. I'll be doing one which is a slightly different uh, thing later or, you know, sort of like, try and be helpful. Because, again, I always put up on my hand when they say, when I go right. Who in here would have probably been sent off to a, if they lived there would have been sent off to a um, concentration camp? Me. Not Jewish. I'm Christian, but my mum's maiden name is Jacobs, which again isn't Ju uh, she isn't Jewish, but that name is close enough that the odds are we'd have been sent off. So. That's the reality you're living in in that sort of world. And also, if you look at my, my you know, some of the statistics, uh, my nose is quite fat. <sighs> yeah, that they went by. All right then. Graham Hanna, L3 were Prussian. Karen Aris and Raider acted more like it. Donitz didn't. He was something else. Mm. Hello, yeah. Hello, the Shrike. Sound Freeman, good evil is about what you are or what or who you are prepared to sacrifice for your goal rather than your goal normally. Hmm. Hey, brother, Tempest will be renamed Blackburn, Blackburn, Blackburn. <laughs> I wouldn't say no. It'd be quite funny. What did Donitz do after he got out? He wrote books. Which are not particularly, I wouldn't consider particularly well written books. They're worth reading, but I am not going to review them because I get too rude. Do you think Donitz maybe gets off lightly because someone wanted to pick his brain on tactics? Not really. Well, the Americans maybe, but not there. They didn't need it, and the Brits didn't need it. They all had a fairly good submarine arms. The Soviet Union wasn't bothering about that. Hi, Sam Wilson. Hello. Evening. And sadly, you do not pronounce Donitz like it's spelt. O is not O. Head, heard worse, though. All right. Donitz becoming head of state was wholly illegal under German law. So that's that. Yep. As I said, uh, as I've said in the video about Donitz, he doesn't really come up with tactics. He's more of a bludgeon. Hmm. Mostly it was Soviet Union unrestricted submarine warfare, and frankly, the Americans and Brits didn't want that getting out with their publics. <sighs> Senator Clare, probably not hung, Bomber Harris, because you have to remember that if you did that, then you'd have to go after LeMay and all the others who did the did the bombing in Japan with the atomic bombs. This is the problem. Once you go down this route, you get into a lot of issues, which is why the Allah and Nuremberg trials were like they were. Nuremberg trials were about establishing a new order in Europe and the world. They weren't necessarily entirely about justice or entirely about um, changing war and all those sort of things. Mm. Brennan Mogg, any, any opinion on the Japanese turning boats into anime, and by extension, getting many young people in anime history? I'm always happy with it. That, that's my policy. I don't care how people get interested in naval history. I care they get interested in naval history. That's my view. Anyone who says different is not really caring about the study of naval history. They're just wanting to stroke their egos and mainly they're usually the ones who also want to make history more and more defined by, oh, well, you know, not everyone can study it. Go away. History's got to be open to all, because if all can't learn from it, then it's never go we're never going to improve as a pe person, people, country, 
genus, planet, anything. If you limit the access to history, and if you limit the avenues into history, you make it elite. You don't. You don't. You stop it serving. I am a passionate advocate for history to not only be taught to everyone, but to be taught well to everyone. And in my experience, most history teachers will teach it well if given a chance. And that usually means access to doing field trips and funding and those sort of things. And I get involved and try and do my best to help out. That. And I go around and talk schools. I am happy to go and talk to schools. I love it. I can go into talk to schools and I can do history based around their A level and all these things and be an extra, extra speaker coming and talk to the GCC students before they make decisions about A levels or their key stage three students before they make decisions about GCC, all that stuff. I love doing that because I think it's worthwhile. I think it matters. So anything that gets people in history. Uh, Ron, uh, Ron Cash, I find the good and evil debate like no Japanese surrender myth. When the reality is no prisoners were taken after a few idiotic actions by the surrendered, much like in the bulge. Hmm. Putin, Putin would, uh, Patton would definitely be committing war crimes if he wasn't held back. I don't think so. You see, Patton is one of those people. He's kind of like Canaris. In that... Canaris will do, uh, has his line. Patton has his line. He will do anything before that line, but he has a line in the sand. And that's the thing. I always remember the story about him telling off a, a trooper for not having his tie on. And then the trooper produces a medical note which says the reason he can't have his tie because he was wounded in uh, one of the battles. And he then takes the trooper out and buys a drink, I see, and buys him a drink and says sorry. For, uh, he, Patton is a hard. Yeah, Patton is hard. He is a tough driver. But he's not that. He, he He's not that. There are many things Patton would do. Don't, don't get me wrong. If he would have, if he has cut off enemy, he has no qualms calling in airstrikes and artillery because, in his view, that saves his troops' lives and is spit faster. That's not because he wants to kill them all, but it's because it's faster. Um, Harris was read in on. Not all of Ultra. No one was read in on all of Ultra. But he did have some areas of Ultra given to him. Dan Freeman. I don't think that any new Nazis would have but that's because I put the ish into Jewish. Yeah. We all have reasons. Uh, Braylet Mog, just the point, my little cousins watch this, okay? So, I'm going to consider that okay, but there is a reason I keep things to, P uh, to roughly what I would call PG, uh, to about age 16 on the thing, because whilst they're mostly younger than 16, they are mostly have that reading age. So that's when I keep things. I don't go quite over 18 or, new, or beyond in language. I, I do try and keep that careful. Graham Hunter. Donnick's got very lucky, as Jodl and Kyle weren't, and all three were part of the high command. Mm. Ron Cash, so true. Mm. Alex. Yeah, I have seen and I have seen the Jordan Peterson um, video, and what struck me was that I hadn't seen the Jordan Peterson video before I did it, and I found it interesting because he, of course, does it from psychology uh, psychology perspective, and I do it from a history perspective. And I will stand up here and say I don't agree with everything Jordan Peterson says, but I did find that one interesting because I said I do it from a history perspective, he does it from a psychology perspective, and it's quite interesting to see how another educator, and he is one. 
um, does it. He's actually one of those people who I wouldn't mind having a conversation with about that sort of thing because I, it's not, it's interesting sometimes listening and talking to people who do try and do these things from different uh, from different perspectives so you can get ideas for how to improve your own. That uh, could be worse. The Waterloo campaign wasn't again against Napoleon. Wasn't a personal war. The, the war declared against Napoleon Bonaparte, not against France. That was because technically the British and everyone was still allied with the French government and uh, the French king. And technically, what they did was it was a sort of nice way to get round it. In that, um, this meant that they didn't have to declare war on. Uh, they could claim that they were supporting the rightful France rather than. Um, Doing a war of aggression. It's all about politics. Frederico Vega, for all that, it's all there is to say is sub, sub, sub. True. But this means why some of Raider's decisions are worthwhile looking at. Um, in November 1932, Raider stated they needed an Umbau, a rebuilding program of one aircraft carrier, six cruisers, six destroyer flotillas. That's roughly 48 destroyers, although, as I said, there is some, some debate about that. Uh, 16 new boats and six battleships to allow Germany to control both the Baltic and North Seas against aggression by France. In January 1939, he was asked to provide a plan for war against Britain by 1948. And it called for a fleet of 10 battleships, 4 aircraft carriers, 15 Panzerschiff, 5 heavy cruisers, 44 light cruisers, 68 destroyers, and 249 new boats. Don't take this wrong way, but by golly, is that light on destroyers. I mean, seriously, if there was a Royal Navy Admiral looking at this plan in 1939, I, I would just, I would have been shocked to see their reaction. If this had been presented to Admiral Henderson, he'd have sat there and he'd have got, looked at Raider and gone, I'm giving you a C minus for this. Seriously, destroyers, uh, destroyers, destroyers. You're going to need them. You cannot operate any of this force without an escort of destroyers. So you have 68 destroyers. You're going to need roughly half a flotilla per capital ship. So you've got 10 battleships, 4 aircraft carriers. Uh, so that's 14. So times that by 4. Well, in the nicest way, that's 56. So you've now got 12 destroyers left. Uh, 15 Panzer Schiff, 5 heavy cruisers, 44 light cruisers. They're all going to need escorts. And you haven't got enough light cruisers to fill the, uh, fill the destroyer's role, because you can basically get, well, three of them for each. So each group is going to have three light cruisers and four destroyers as their escorts. Well, that's going to type your light cruisers quite merrily, so they won't be able to do much. Sorry. Not sure where the spider's gone. I caught a spider and then he disappeared. Oh. One thing of working in the garden, you have spiders. Uh, this is just not a good plan. It just really isn't a good plan. And see Macdology and Trippets being sacrosanct, that's just... Mm. And the thing is, and the point I tend to make is... Tirpitz actually isn't even the best thinker of his period of the German Navy. Honestly, he's possibly down the bottom. He's just the one who's most good at shouting it loudly. Okay, let's see. Da, 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 da. Sub, sub, subs. Um, William Cox, consider Nazi human rights programs from the point of view of vaccination publicity today. People are just weird and the unscrupulous know how to push buttons. Ah, yes. Go have the vaccine. I've had two doses and I might well end up getting a third one because I live with shielded people who are going to have to have a third one. And I honestly tell people it. I've been fine. Far more sensible. By the way, I had the flu jab every year. I've had vaccines against measles, mumps, and rubella, all sorts of things. I might, well, you know, 
You hang around the armed forces that often, they will inject stuff into you. <sighs> Deal with it. Eric Vasava. Um, Brandon Mong, I said if anime get in if anime gets you into naval history, then I love it. I didn't uh, please note I didn't use the word of the middle word. Again, little cousins watching. Um, Dope Scott, a friend of mine did their Lawmaster's dissertation year ago. Wrote a lot about how the idea of due process took a back seat to getting the right results. Mm, yeah. Hi, but uh, let's see. William Cox, read the US appointed public defender's book on me very well. All about abuse of process. Yeah. They skip law depending on which one they need, uh, which one the work best for them. Oh, Cash, I believe the worst limitation to history teachers is curriculum. I was taught my uh, World War I uh, through poetry and idiot generals, when the reality is so very different. Ah, uh, yes, the reality is. World War I and idiot generals. That one I hear far too often. Hmm. Uh, see much. The difference in war crimes is this: independent actions or institutionalized actions. That is the line somewhat grayly drawn. It gets fuzzy at certain points. Ron Cash, Patton is the beast, but also had diplomacy issues. Maybe the Admiral King of Generals. It's one of the interesting things because. If you watch the movie about Patton, he gets on very well with Bradley. If you read any of the accounts from the time by personal people, he hates Bradley and gets on well with Montgomery. It's it's kind of an interesting one. But of course, when the Patton movie was produced, Bradley was chief of staff of the U.S. Army at that point, and that was his sort of thing to fix history. Sorry, spider again. At some point, I'm going to see it, and it's going to go outside, but it keeps managing to get away from me. It's a good dodging and surviving. Um... Now, Team Looker, since we're talking war crimes here, is the nuking of cities and killing their civilian population a war crime? Let's put it this way. It's complicated, and no one's done it again since, officially. That we can really prove. And as Dan Freeman says, they were legal partly because they hadn't been conceived when they were writing laws. And so it's a loophole. Mm -hmm. That is the trouble. Right now. Yes, if you're all going to start supporting war crimes. No one's supporting war crimes, Stephen. Uh, Vision, was is the Phoebus Film Studio Crisis? Uh, what is the Phoebus Film Studio Crisis? Ah, well, that's an interesting one. Okay, so the Film Studio Crisis is what gets Raider into power because the, uh, the German Navy had been running a film studio in order to get around certain rules about materials they could have, i.e. primarily mercury. The one problem with this, they've been running it badly, and despite huge government subsidies, it managed to go bankrupt. And the actual complaint of most of the people involved wasn't that the German Navy had been getting round laws by doing this, by running this, uh, this film studio. Most of the problems were that they went bankrupt. Anyway, the bankruptcy of it causes Canarius to be, to an extent, persona grata uh, for a bit, which is why he is off in the post he is and is away from things when he's called back to become uh, the, he the head of the Avver. And Raider gets promoted to become the chief of staff of the Navy because he's felt to be the best at telling the selling politicians on Simacology. Mm -hmm. 
Panzer Grand Gasper. Improved Panzer Chief looked okay, -ish, but 15 of them is just stupid. 15 of them is just, yeah. The nicest way, um, I think, as I wrote here, and I seem to remember writing, uh, between November 1932 and January 1938, so let's say seven years, oh, six years be nice. Three Panzer Chief and two Shan Horse. Uh, shell stuff, battleships, um, as they call them, had actually been completed, and it wasn't any that much better on the lower levels. So, in the nicest way, no. And um, before anyone sort of thinks about it, yes, there is planned to be a video, um, a um, t-shirt which has "in the nicest way" on, mainly because you have started using it back in comments to me, and so therefore, it's probably reached the point at which it's become my catchphrase. I don't know how. Brian Cash, when you said Japanese naval minister was someone to the head of navy, I was amazed. Did the, uh, apply to the, uh, that apply to the Japanese navy too? Uh, uh, head of the navy? I was surprised. Did this apply to the Japanese navy too? A uh, Japanese army too, I'm presuming. Yes. And uh, normally the minister was a junior, uh, sort of uh, a senior, but junior amongst the senior admirals, and the chief of staff and navy would be more would outrank them, and the chief of staff could order them to resign as minister, and that would cause the government to fall. It's a powerful post being chief of staff of the Japanese navy, or chief of staff of the uh, Japanese army. Hello, I'm 16365, and hello, Dev Squad, Team Luka, hello. Ron Cash, if you want to see real naval strength, look at the destroyers back in the day, they are the element of force multiplier. Agreed. I was promised I would get magneto powers out of vaccine, but no such luck yet. And I still haven't got improved Wi Fi, it's terrible. Mm-hmm. Hmm. uh, Brain at Mong. Uh, did Germany ever try to make the fleet submarine concept work pre-Cold War? Honestly, the the thing is, again, this is something which goes back to Donuts, but to an extent is Raider persuaded by Donuts. Donuts is far more obsessed with a small submarine. And this is why he ends up focusing in on the Type 7, being the largest submarine you want, and it causes some of the trouble with developing the Type 20, Type 21s and Type 23s. Honestly, they could have probably been in service earlier had he accepted them being slightly bigger. Because you could have got certain things to work in a slightly bigger hull slightly quicker. And possibly could have built them actually quicker. Th that sounds converse, but here is the thing. Well, uh, when it, everything's crammed into a smaller space, it takes longer to slot it in, because it all has to be slotted in far more precisely and far more perfectly. When you have a ever so slightly larger space, you can be more quick. And you can also do maintenance a lot easier. It's one of the reasons why the Royal Navy, and you have this whole fight going on with Admiral Henderson and Chatfield, Vice Admiral Henderson versus, when he's Third Sea Lord versus um, Admiral Chatfield, who's the First Sea Lord time. And basically Chatfield's going, we need small destroyers, many small destroyers. And Henderson's going, you want small destroyers, and you say you need them because you'll need less crew. That's wrong. I can actually have Less crew for a larger destroyer, but I need more crew for a smaller destroyer. Because on a smaller destroyer, everything takes more man-hours to do it because it's in such confined spaces. Whereas on a larger destroyer, I can have nice runways between the engines, I can have spaces for them to get round, things for them to do it, which will make actually maintenance a lot quicker, which allows you to do it with fewer people. Uh, and he produces studies, and he basically 
beats the first Sea Lord up to get what he wants, which is the larger destroyers. He doesn't get the L class he's wanting, the L seventies, but he gets pretty much the L forties for the Jays. William Cox, Bradley's book is worth reading. It is worth reading. I don't agree with everything in it because I think some of it's reimagined for Bradley's own ego, but we'll leave that to one side. Um, Grace Elsie, just imagining little cousins running to parents and asking, what are what Brainlet said? This is the trouble. Then I get phone calls. Of which Brainlet, thank you, there's at least two going through now. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just going to claim it's not my fault. Yeah, not my fault. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Brainlet Mong, they have access to TikTok. Thankfully, I, I, I don't know if they have access to TikTok. I don't want to know. <sighs> I don't want to know. Uh, uh, Graham Hannah, mind you, Patton was arrested for breaking public decency. Lol, showing off his Forrest Gump wound. Mm, that wouldn't surprise me. Are there any good film movies produced by that film studio? I don't think so. I think mostly they worked on silent movies, it seems to me. And um, no, I haven't seen a single good one which has got on the list, which I would tell people to go and watch. The Shrike seems tribal spied up, potentially. Uh, Visions, uh, why were World War II German Navy uniforms sold fashion compared to the Allies? Second from left. Uh, hang on. I think that's him here. Yeah. Him, basically. Raider. Obsessed with turpits. As I said in his, in my description of him, he has an officer follow another officer around Italy on his honeymoon, telling that officer to commit suicide because that officer had divorced his wife and married someone else, so he felt it was a terrible dishonour to be... I think that officer was actually an army officer as well, from memory. It's a case of... Oh my lord. Who put you in charge? Um, that's good. Mm, potentially, uh, I would say the reason Patton got on with, uh, to be honest, and this is sort of from the staff officers, Patton got on with, well with Montgomery because they're both hard chargers who didn't care about other people. So they respected that about each other. And there was a friendly rivalry. But it was a friendly rivalry. It's like sort of in Italy, they spend they send bottles of alcohol to each other, you know, as each uh, as a sort of congratulations for getting places first and those sort of things in Sicily. They have a great running respect. He doesn't have respect for Bradley, and he finds Eisenhower a bureaucrat. I'm not sure why he doesn't have respect for Bradley. I think possibly because he considers. Bradley's too close to Eisenhower, so potentially another bureaucrat in budding waiting. Uh, William Cox, most effective destroyers ever, day ever. Uh, was it Johnston or Campbelltown? Well, Campbelltown is mainly as a bomb, so you probably want to go with Johnston, but I would say, frankly, Eskimo at Narvik might get an honorary mention, as might some of the HMS Javelin at certain points. Alex Anderson, what was the best pre-1945 warship to serve on for food and accommodation? All of them are pretty tight. If you're an officer, there is more space. And if you're an officer, probably a town-class cruiser or something like that. But if you're a sailor, you probably want to be on a destroyer because... You'll you'll have a you'll have more you'll have space. It's still you'll be quite cramped, but you will have not not have to deal with quite so many smelly armpits. Use the French there. Will 
William Cox, the peak coat remained in service because it worked and looked good. Um, yeah, I'm not sure about this uniform, honestly. This uniform looks a bit frockish to me. Like they're frock coats and they're going to be very... Hmm. Uh, Admiral Beatty wrote the Grand Admiral while he was still with you uh, uh, with us and received a very nice uh, thank you card and signed photo. Hanging in my library, the rest of the collection. Halsey Nepens Act. Cool. Sorry, L70 destroyers. Anywhere I could find out more info on them. Uh, the L70 designs. Um, go and look up my video about tribal class destroyers and Royal Navy's interwar escorts, and you'll find quite a lot of details, and you'll probably find some book recommendations there. So if you go back to some of the earlier videos I did, and on the tribal battles and daring and where they came from. Raymond Mung, did any of the German admirals know about the A400s? If not, how would they have reacted? I don't think they did know until potentially they knew it, certainly they were informed once the war began and once they were sort of the tripartite alliance was assigned, but prior to that I doubt they knew. The Japanese didn't really make a big fuss about them and I don't think the Germans knew. The I-400s could have been interesting. Uh, if, the, not, if Germany had had I-400s, and I'm not talking I-400s with their idea of doing a seaplane attack, but I'm talking I-400s with the seaplanes taken out, but are, a lot of, uh, are able to take a lot of fuel and a lot of torpedoes places, then they could have done a really nasty thing on the American coast in World War II. Vision. Is The Art of Longsword a good book? Um... Mm -hmm. I have literally just had this arrive today, so I have no idea. I have got it out of its packaging today. It looks a good book, but I have a, I, I'm going to be reading through it, and then at some point I am probably going to show it to my good friend, Drakenafel, and go, what do you think? And then another point, uh, we'll probably both um, pick up long swords and do some of the practice battles that they've got here, because they've got whole practice pictures of Ben and his friend Randy. And showing what they're doing. So, um, yeah, it could be interesting. At some point, you could see a video which is me and Drac fighting with longswords. Um, I'm sorry, son, French name must have good scran. No way would they not have fed their crews well. Uh, you would be so disappointed about that. Seneca Nero, let's be honest, if a modern chief of staff did that, allowing and following and trying to build into bullying the suicide, they would probably get a dishonorable discharge. Well, the fact that they dispatch one of their staff officers to do it, uh, these days, in the nicest way, if you dispatch and try to dispatch a staff officer to do that, they would probably tweet it out, and within five minutes, you'd be getting a phone call from someone going, What are you doing, you imbecile? Um, we'll leave that to one side, though, because it's now uh, Prince Fushimi Hiroshima. Hiroshima. Mm. You see, I would say, and this is my fundamental view of Patton, is Patton didn't really care about anything else other than your willingness to fight. So, 
he, in one way, he could have been. He, he would certainly have not held his tongue and said exactly what he thinks the whole time, for the whole time, which could have got him into quite severe trouble. But in other ways, he would probably, in fact, most likely, would have been possibly the perfect general for today. In that, frankly, all the rest of that would be going on. He'd just be going, I don't care. I honestly don't care. I care if you shoot straight and you'll do your job. That's all, the, all I need to know. Reading Monty's, um, Moni's bio, Monty's bio on Wikipedia, the suggestion was that his personality successes were... Muted for about a decade by his wife allowing him to get through difficult mid-career patch. Wait, hmm? I, I, I'm not sure. Well, that's well off topic. That's more a Bilge Trump's topic, but I would say, in nicest way, uh, USN trying to get a modern stealth submarine aircraft carrier working is very, very unlikely. I, I For starters, they don't really need to. If you want to have carrier strike, uh, why would you need aircraft from a submarine? Do you want to have a reconnaissance drone? Well, you can pack that onto a vertical launch missile if you want to. And you could pack one of those into a VLS silo and shoot it out. Uh, you couldn't recover it, but it would be a one-shot job. Uh, but also, would you really want a submarine at that close to the surface all that time to receive that information? Probably not. So, honestly, it would be set, it would launch it from close by, then it would gather the information, the information would probably be sent back home, and then satellite microburst transmission back to the submarine at a certain point. And then the submarine would just launch a strike with its other VLS. Why do you need to have a carrier? This is the point about it being vaporware. It's more likely not, not nothing the Navy's actually investing in because no one serious would be doing that. <sighs> hmm. Kenrick Johnson, you haven't missed the German bash, and there's going to be a lot more. <sighs> Australia and her future nuke subs, in fact, uh, seems a good complimentary topic. The Battle Atlantic 2 will be in the Pacific. There is Bilge Pumps already up today, episode 64. Please go have a look at it, or listen. That be, uh, is where we talk about that. As Santa can know, the prince is like if Prince Philip became first sea lord with his wife being crown princess. To an extent, yes, there is certainly a connection. Hmm. Alexander Simon, how long did it take you to get your doctorate? Three years bachelor's, one year master's, three years writing my PhD thesis, six months getting it through Viva, well, a little under six months, and then six months waiting for graduation. So technically it's four years on my PhD. So technically, if you go back for all that, eight years. I got it when I was 26. Which is roughly eight years ago. Ron Cash, if Pan was in the first Gulf War, there wouldn't have been a second. There is no way anyone would have stopped him reaching Baghdad. Hmm. Anyway, Fushimi Hiroshi, uh, who's far more interesting for comparing to um, good old Donets. He's born in Tokyo, uh, Tokyo as Prince Narukuta, the other son of Prince Fushimi Senoka, uh, Sandano by one of the uh, prince's concubines. So he's basically his son, but not his son by his wife, but that doesn't matter at this time. He is an interesting career. 
And the point you have to remember about him is that he is senior enough and powerful enough that Hirohito himself can't ignore him and others can't really assassinate him. It's one of the interesting what-ifs of history. And the thing was, he is definitely the leader of the Navy faction. But I would say his viewpoint on the Navy faction is that you cannot deter conflict with America by joining the treaties. You don't have enough force. So that's why he wants to break the treaties. Which is why he gets on with one of the other people we're going to be talking about later, who's definitely a leader of the treaty faction. And it's one of the interesting things, is that the leaders of the treaty faction and the fleet faction get on. And this gentleman at the times tells you to uh, very, very strongly says, do not try and assassinate X. And he's very quite, uh, quite tough on that one. But there are issues going on. What do you think about the Hollywood trope of the character having like a dozen PhDs? They must have come from a very rich family. Not cheap. As it is, um, my sister has a PhD as well, but hers is in civil engineering. And she tends to refer to history, which I did as the rich person subject, because um, in her view, you... You know, engineering is pra is the pragmatic subject. Everyone that you should do, and history is the one you do as your hobby because it's uh, you know it it's a rich person's topic. And I go, no, you need it. Student, the thing to understand the Japanese royal family is that until after the war, it was multiple families who had intermarried into the original royal family over the previous centuries. True. He wasn't a half br a brother to Hirohito. He was a cousin to Hirohito. Um, I have it listed up. I will go for it. But, uh, he is 23rd head of the Fushima no, Ma no Maya, one of the four Shinoke cadet branches of the Imperial family. In that sort of have a right of succession should there be a default of the direct heir. Um, furthermore, he was second cousin to Emperor Showa, or Hirohito and Empress Kojun, and nephew of Prince Kan and Kotito. He's also married to Toguwa Tsuzunko, the ninth daughter of Prince Toguwa Yoshinobu, the uh, Japan's last shogun. Uijawa. Hi, uh, Crazy Warriors cat fan. So, he is a very interesting person, and as you know, I put that up Amor Chichui Nagoma there for his key decisions, because frankly, who wouldn't want this scary, intimidating gentleman staring over your shoulder? Um, and by God, does it look even when he's even when he's supposedly posing a nice facial reaction, he looks like he's trying to intimidate and scare the living day out of you. I don't think he should have launched an airstrike on Pearl Harbor. I think he should have just gone and landed there and stared at the American fleet himself. Hello, what's wrong? Okay, all right. I'll come up. Okay, this is uncomfortable. There we go. That's off. Here. That's what you wanted off. It was uncomfortable. Was it? Not a biscuit. Good boy. You know, he, he is a powerful, powerful looking gentleman. Uh, pursuing, uh, Prince Fushimi Horioso uh, was the leader and critical support of the fleet faction, as I said. And 
basically it's his power and connections which win that fight. It's his capabilities which win that fight. Um, he's probably, as a result, the single most important admiral um, in setting up for World War II in the Far East. Because if you think about it, if in 1934, if Japan doesn't terminate the treaty, then America's political hands are more limited in what they can do to her. In that they have to sort of respect the treaty system. And it's sort of, while they're in the treaty, whilst they're in the League of Nations, there is a limit to what America can really do. Mm hmm. There are all the things that are definitely a spiritual subject. History isn't one of them. Yeah, doing a PhD is kind of expensive. <laughs> Lucky I got funding. Um, Allied occupation got rid of most of the extended imperial family post war. Yes, the Americans push and get those clans, you know, uh, caught, uh, uh, issues, let's say. The, uh, because of um, the way MacArthur especially rat land, uh, writes the tra uh, right to the treaty. In Animal 16.365, it also seems like the, tr the treaties, Washington, the first long labor treaties, in a way, save the Japanese economy from going bankrupt. Uh, a, I will just add a cash uh, that Drac has a wife. B, I think my sister taught him. <laughs> uh, we, uh, we have worked it out and think that maybe uh, Karen actually, my sister, taught him at one point. And, um,. Listen, Dr. Alex, I'm not going to try and connect your, connect your, correct your pronunciation from your own. It's that bad. Uh, is it? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it is that. I did try. I did try to get my pronunciation better. Um, I have been working on it, but it's just it's just going to pop. It's been one of those weeks. It was my mom's birthday last week and all the other things. Anyway. He is the thing about uh, Hiroyoso, who I, which I find annoying is, and this is why I sometimes wonder if the treaties hadn't happened, it would have actually been better for Japan because they would have reached the limit of their economically viable. They would have seen what Britain and America were building, and they would have probably ended up going, "Okay, we can't do this. We need to actually build some decent infrastructure." That's the problem with the treaties. No more. Uh, with the treaties, they um, get saved from reaching that point, so they get to have the idea that they wouldn't reach that point. Which is, of course, not true. No. 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 You want you might want another biscuit, but you're not getting another one. You're going to uh, have to learn. You can't keep having biscuits. And let's see. I think I am going to change the pace of this a bit. Because otherwise, I'm never going to get through them all. Bum, 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 bum. And the, ultimately, the problem with the um the ultimate <laughs> oh da -da 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 -da. the problem. With um, Hirioso is just like Donets, like Radar. He doesn't really manage to get any pre get the preparations done for war. It's one of the things. Yeah. 
they know all know war's coming, and they all think it's coming a long way off. But Herioso knows war is closer than most. War's broken out in Europe. He knows his people are agitating for war soon. A crash building program of escorts? Something. There are lots of things he could have justified with war going on, but he doesn't. And this is on him. It really is. Just issuing the photo thing is a cultural thing. Um, honestly, I think if and Nagumo was smiling, I think I would find that scarier than him looking like that. Mm hmm Like that? Um... Graham Hunter, I didn't think USA was a member of the league. Would he? They, USA wasn't a member of the league, no. But whilst J when Japan was a member of the league, there was limitations on, Japan, uh, on what the USA could do to them. Um... You need some class in Japanese. I do. Uh, Dan Freeman, I try my best to get them in the right order. Occasionally it goes a bit wrong. Uh, I, I, I sort it out mostly with English. <laughs> Hello, Ralph Shelfers. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying that out loud, the squad, because that will just make him wake up. But to, uh, Frederick Vega, are you planning an IG staff series? Yes. <sighs> mm hmm. Uh, no, Wilson didn't manage to get, Woodrow didn't manage to get the USA to join the League of Nations. Basically, he got his idea, but he was gone before, well, out of action before he could get them through. Also, why are Japanese NCO, why are NCO pilots not so impossible for Japan? Not Japan does have NCO pilots from my understanding of it. But it's the way they're functioning the programs and training them. They don't really have... This is going to sound very, very strange to say, but the Japanese system is not good at... Gener it's not designed to keep continually generating pilots. It's designed with a very short war in mind. I, you take your best to war, they all go, they all fight, it's one glorious battle, and then it's over. And the thing is, the amount of Japanese admirals who keep saying, oh no, 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 any war against America is not going to be a short war, and then they don't prepare their pipelines for a long war. Animal 16365. So the Chiefs of Staff were, for both Germany and Japan were surprised that their governments went to war earlier than they thought. Um, Germany, definitely. Japan, less so, because they were involved in the decision-making process. And they basically decided when they were going to go to war as a collective. And the people who opposed going to war were got rid of. Uh, it's It's one of the interesting things that uh, the prince, as I've been talking about him, Hirioso, uh, so it, he is, he loses, he, he, he is, um, removed from his post after years of chief of the, uh, chief of the naval staff, uh, before war begins. And there are arguments as to whether he's removed to uh, stop him being culpable, if anything goes wrong. There are arguments whether he's removed to stop the royal family being considered culpable in case there are any losses. There is also the big argument that he is removed because it's a political struggle with Tojo, 
who hasn't taken post yet, but is still is pretty powerful and important. Um, because if how do I put this? Tojo cannot order the prince around. The prince is far too politically powerful, adept, and skilled. Tojo is not going to win that fight. And if Tojo has him assassinated, which is his preferred method of dealing with threats, then Tojo would have found himself killed. Put it nicely. So the only it ends up being a battle, and it ends up being about uh, the uh, the prince ends up being ret retiring and just being uh, serving on the uh, Supreme War Council rather than having to deal with running the Navy. Come on, I, uh, no, Graham, I didn't say the League had teeth. Please note, I didn't say that. I said while Japan was a member of the League, nations were supposed to resolve, is resolve issues within the League. So it get, becomes problematic. One of the things which stops Britain and France being able to do much to Italy about Somalia and various other incidents is because Italy is a member of the League. So this is the reality. There are problems. If you are a member of these things, you have cover. It's kind of like the modern United Nations. If you're a member of the uh, Security Council, you can pretty much do what you like. Decision. The Japanese infrastructure, both physical and social, was not designed to handle losses. Uh, Japan from Meiji had been focused on catching up, but always thought that meant the battleship and stuff. Ah, uh, to an extent. That being, IJ and German planning for short, sharp wars with Western Europe or USA, but then also for another war on soon after against USSR or USSR or British Empire and Dutch East Indies. Hmm. How did they retire him? If he was the most powerful navy and could make the minister resign. Uh, you have a good reason there, and the reason he couldn't be got rid he could be got rid of is because of who the minister of the navy was at the point when he was got rid of. Uh, the Minister of the Navy in... That period. Mm -hmm. I'll just go back to there. I will find the details I needed. Mm -hmm. Now, he is... He serves till April nineteen. Uh, play, uh, let's see. Uh, he serves till April nineteen forty one as chief of staff, and I did think so. At that point, the person who is minister of the navy is a guy called Sengo Yoshida. who is forced to resign due to illness and opposition to the, uh, how do I put this, the uh, tripartite pact between Nazi Germany and Italy and Japan in September 1940 as well himself. The thing is, if Hirioso decided it wasn't good to destroy the entire government just because he didn't want to lose his post. And in a way, he becomes even more of a problem for Togo to deal with. And I would argue that the getting rid of Hiroyoso is the point at which Togo's days start being numbered. Hmm. 
I love what um, David Lloyd George said about the, the Treaty of Versailles. I had Napoleon on one side and Jesus Christ on the other. Milt Wilson was Jesus. Someone saw. <sighs> Wanted to famously squeeze the uh, pips, the German pips, till uh, uh, German orange till the pips squeaked. Hello, Shrike616. The live keeps fritzing on my end. Um, I'm not sure why. I hope it, uh, I've got full signal, Sam's at the moment. Um, I'm six three nine. Japanese military at the time requires me a series of game friends. Well, if that's what that describes you, wait till you got to the Italian one. Meet Domenico Cavanari. Yeah, I have, there is very few other pictures where Benito Mussolini looks less pompous than the other person in the picture with him. This is one of them. Honestly, look at this guy. Have you ever seen anyone who looks more, I don't know how to describe it. It's just... Goodness gracious me! <sighs> and this is the officer for whom a lot of the attach issues for the Italian Navy come about, because There is a simple fact. He spends the entirety of his time as Chief of Staff of the Italian Navy with Mussolini as Minister of the Navy. You have literally the dictator as your direct boss if you want to get checks signed. Plus, he's well known for signing things when drunk. Take advantage of it! I was asking, if Japan built the infrastructure, would they have had enough resources to build a form of additional ships on those shiny new slipbys and fuel to run the masters? Well, if they produced some systems which turn coal to or uh, coal to fuel, and there are various, you know, uh, as I said, uh, sort of uh, manufactured pe uh, manufactured um, petroleum plants which Germany etc. had, and they had contacts they could have got then they could certainly have had more fuel supplies. If they had combined that... And I'm just going to close the window. It's getting a bit late. If they had combined that with a bit more infrastructure for construction and maintenance of ships, then they could have achieved something. I, I, I don't think they would have ever had the resources to win. But there is a difference between saying actually having a viable level of resources that they might not have lost so badly, and having the resources to win. They might have had enough that they could have felt confident enough. I think one of the other troubles for Japan is because of their limited resources, they don't feel strong. They have this image they're being strong, but there's a sort of thing in the back of the head saying, but we're woefully outnumbered and outgunned. We're woefully outnumbered. We're woefully outnumbered. They're so massive. That gives them a sort of superiority inferiority complex that I think feeds into their decision and psyche when they're dealing with the Americans. Do not ever tell your mummy. Cousins, don't tell your parents. Right. Um. Japanese military at the time reminds me of that came of France. Already read a while. Uh, could you make the argument, uh, Alfie Rowe? Hello, Alfie. Uh, could you make the argument that Japanese high command suffered from 
not being meritocratic enough, i.e. giving the royal family far too much military power? No. You couldn't. There aren't that many royal mem members of the royal family who are that pa who are that powerful in the military. Uh, Hirioso is powerful because he is, and actually, in some regards, you need more of them because they can't assassinate members of the royal family. So, if you'd had the army and the navy headed by someone like him, you would potentially, potentially have had peace between the IJ and the IJN. They would have potentially sorted out because ultimately, it would have been a. Come to dinner with your cousin. Yes. I don't like officers keep killing each other. Night, Doctor. Uh, night, uh, night, night, Roland Cash. Take care. They are Italians. They are supposed to look good. I, 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 I don't. I don't think either one of them looks good. There again, they're not wearing a um, it's a t-shirt like mine. Uh, you're going after the biscuits yourself. <laughs> you're cutting out the middleman, are you? No. I don't know. Okay. Hello, Treco zero one. I'm not sure this popped up in notifications for me, considering I'm not a subscriber. Well, I'm glad it did, and thank you for coming along. Um, <laughs> hello, yes, <laughs> you are shameless. You are, you are shameless. Don't even try it. Go on, hello. Um. Uh, Kaminari is a long patrol sound, uh, a long patrol, in long patrol sound like some mediocre department director who was assigned because there wasn't found anyone better, but he is too kind to the higher boss in, uh, in fear of losing the warm place. Yes, pretty much he is. He is. Oh, I love it. Sean V, the Italian gent looks like a hotel commissioner. Yeah, there is something similar. There is something similar. Look, he, there is the key decisions. He focuses on battleships and submarines, which. I can, to an extent, uh, understand, but I would have said probably if I'd been the Italian Navy, uh, a carrier might have been useful, and a um, uh, some dis uh, more destroyers. And honestly, if he hadn't been building the third of the Venatore or Veneto class, potentially he could have done that. You know, potentially, if he'd just gone with a pair, uh, he could have carried on and got that carrier working. But he didn't want a carrier. He didn't see it. And th this is the point. He is just not... He just not into those things. He doesn't think, they're he doesn't think things through in that way. He is a, a, a stalwart, but not really that amazing a stalwart. When was the time these three navies knew that they were not, uh, they were not going to succeed? The Italian, uh, the Japanese seem to have known from the beginning. The Germans seem to place everything on trying to convince the British to come to the negotiating table. Their theory is always if they destroy enough, the British will come to the negotiating table. That's what they have to do. They have to defeat enough to force the British to negotiate. So that's not really suggesting they're going to get a victory. That suggests they're going to avoid defeat by the British. And the Italians... Well, the Italian Navy is under no illusion. You know, the Italian Navy is sort of looking at the Royal Navy in the Mediterranean and going, hmm? And you have to remember, the Italian Navy wasn't expecting the French to be knocked out like they were at the beginning of World War II. So when the Royal Navy, the Italian Navy is starting in on World War II, they're expecting to have to fight the French Navy and the Royal Navy in the Mediterranean. They're not expecting this one to be a good, a quick and or easy fight. It's there are so many things: the conquest of Norway, the conquest of France. These things were not really expected. They were dreamed of, but they weren't expected to happen quite so quickly and quite so easily for the Axis forces. If you don't have those successes, then World War Two becomes very quickly a well, a nineteen forties era. 
version of World War One, which probably doesn't last as long. What are you doing? Not sure what you were up to, but what, did you find some biscuits on the ground or something? You're not getting any more. Not after those little those little escapades. Um. <laughs> Andrew Camel, well, unloading the van to end a 12-hour shift. Oh, good for you. Good luck with that, you know. <laughs> oh. Peace the, the most dangerous threat to the Japanese Imperial Japanese Army. Yes. Honestly, peace was probably the biggest threat to the IJA. Take care, John Shea. Have a nice night. Um, that's good. The fleshy research system has decided you took too long and are therefore the landlord class is going to see the means of biscuits himself. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Choose the issue. My dog liberated my daughter's ma uh, macchiano yesterday after it left on the table. She's very proud of herself even after the huge stomachache. <laughs> that wouldn't surprise me. So, look. What does he manage to do? Well, they have good battleships, and you have to admit they do have very good battleships, the Italians, in World War II. And honestly, if the Germans could have had the Italian fleet, they'd have been very, very proud. Would have been pretty useful as well for many things. But... <sighs> it's also an unbalanced fleet, and it's an unbalanced fleet when you're looking at the reality of what they're looking at. This is the finite biscuit supply you have open at the moment. There is no more. Well, potentially there's a few more, but I'm going to actually tie this up so you can't keep smelling them, because obviously it's being open. And what I'm also going to do is I'm going to stick it in the helmet, so it's in a nice metal helmet. It means you can't get at it. Um, the Italians try. But they need a more balanced force. They need, uh, you know, one of the things you quickly learn, and um... <laughs> hello, um... <laughs> there you go. That no, no more, no, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> Okay. No. I know, I know, I know. So, the... I know. The Italians, they try. They try to build a navy. They are... <laughs> they build these things. They put them together. They put the... Uh, they, they want to fight, and they want to have this force, but their force is critically imbalanced. You know, not having a carrier... They don't need that bigger carrier to make a difference. But you imagine the Italian fleet roaming around the world with a uh, roaming around the Mediterranean with a carrier which is equipped with eighteen to twenty-four fighters. That's what I need. They need maybe some reconnaissance aircraft, and they need some fighters for air defense. They don't need strike aircraft because they have the land bases for that. They have the air ba land bases for that. It does have strike aircraft. That's useful for when they go further. And this is the thing. Their claim is for Mare Nostrum. That is what their aim is. But at no point... They, they stop the British being able to use the Mediterranean. This is one of the reasons why I tell, often say the Italian Navy is the most Axis critical force, strategic force for the Axis in World War II. Because if you don't have the Italian Navy and the problems they cause in the Mediterranean, then the Royal Navy can shift between fighting the Japanese in the Pacific and the Germans very quickly, because instead of having to go all the way from Africa, they just cut through the sewers of the Mediterranean. And that's the thing. If they could do that, that would have made things very different in World War II. So the Italian Navy is very strategically very important, and the battles of them are therefore very critical. However, Italian Navy... 
No. Thanks to Domenico Cavanari. No. Just no. No. And this is why, actually, I have to say, you know, at least Donitz has an idea. This guy's main thing is, I want battleships. You're never going to build enough to challenge the British. You can probably build enough to beat the French, but that's because on the treaty system, you're allowed to be equal, and let's be honest, the French, who either produce great ships or produce terrible ships, never in between. And you're prepared to cheat more on the system, so, of course, you're probably going to produce better ones. But... But the thing is, that's not going to help. And he's got an allowance for aircraft carriers, so he might as well build it. He's got an allowance for cruisers, might as well use it. Got an allowance for destroyers, might as well use it. The amount of allowance the Italians don't use is quite, you know, problematic for them. <laughs> uh, Treco 001 Is your canine friend working the dog watch? Um, the fluffy research assistant Is probably currently Working the More likely the biscuit watch than the dog watch How are you? He, he is trying Many many things <laughs> well, course, Malta would not have been in danger If not the Italians No, let's be honest, Crete wouldn't happen without the Italians uh, if it hadn't been for the Italians interfering, then the Germans would probably have lost at Crete. Uh, there you go. There's a bit of history which is often overlooked and as we've talked about in several videos on Crete. If it hadn't been for the Italian Navy and Army turning up and doing the stuff they did, then Crete might well not have been the victory that's remembered for for the Germans. Rackstraw. In the nicest way, equals of all due respect. Yeah, to an extent. Calm down a bit. In the Reed Biscuits and Helmet, did you really consider the effects of your head smelling like dog treats? Ah, it smelled like worse. So, Canaris. Now, this is possibly the one which has caused some of the most interesting discussions, because Canaris is this head of the advert, and he's this grey figure, this disappearing figure. And he's different. And he is truly a Prussian officer of the mole, but he's also... He is... An ab a, a, a total... Germophile. That's, that's his job, that's his thing. He is obsessed. He is a patriot through and through for Germany. And... You're a patriot through and through for Bonio, aren't you? Um, uh, Animal 16, most people would have never known the Italians would end up with the most powerful navy at the end of World War II. I don't think they had the most powerful navy at the end of World War II. They certainly had one of the most powerful navies in World War II. One of the most important, strategically powerful and important navies in World War II. Um, like the uh, Cox, like the rest of the Axis, Italia was waging a war on the shoestring. To an extent, yeah. Um, Canaris, was he a double agent? No. Um, he certainly spent a lot of time coveting various connections with the British and other agencies. The interesting thing I find is when you sort of go, he uh, you know, when you start talking about what he wants to do, he wants to try and preserve Germany. He wants to try and protect Germany against his folly. He doesn't like, as I said, he he is not a good person, but he has a line in the sand, and he feels the Nazis have gone beyond that and have gone beyond that pale, and as such. 
he has drawn back to an extent. But I think it's like things when you're talking about, oh, the information coming for, out of Britain was obviously rigged. It was. Now, the point is, uh, the general thing is, he must have been a double agent because he didn't point this out. No. See, that that's putting it on one level. The thing is, does the information coming out of Britain serve his purposes? If it does, then frankly, it doesn't matter him whether it is rigged or not. It doesn't matter him whether it's false or not. What matters him is, does the information serve his purposes? And his purposes are to try and manage the war. That's what he's trying to do. Canaris, at many points, is trying to manage the war. Take care, Timmy Locker. Get some enjoy some sleep. As Sona Canaris put, Canaris is the most interesting character he is. Not a good person. Again, I'm not I'm no point in my saying good person. But He's a very interesting spy master. Now, one of the other interesting things. In 1939, there was another admiral who was head of intelligence service. Admiral Hugh Sinclair was head of the uh, British intelligence service, MI6. He actually dies in November 1939. So, for a while, in the late 1930s, there were a lot of intelligence organizations being run by admirals. And this probably is because, honestly, the navies have been running intelligence services for a long time by this point. They have been involved. There's been naval intelligence around for a long, long time. Um, I don't know. John Goffrey is one of the most famous of the British ones. Who is a naval intelligence officer. And... Honestly, there's also famously Godfrey, theoretically, M of James Bond is based on Godfrey. Is based on who he was and what he did and how he managed things. So, you know, it's something to think about. Andrew Campbell, can a good spy master be a good person, or is a degree of callousness, shall we say, a necessary prerequisite to be effective? That is an interesting, uh, interesting uh, psychological and philosophical question. In theory, probably yes. But in practice, you have to have to justify doing a lot of 
interesting and nasty things. In which case, that takes, if you're trying to be a good person the whole way through, that takes a lot of cognizant dissonance, uh, cognizant um, dissonance. And I don't think, I don't think in the end you can be that cognizant and dissonant to get away with that. Bantrim, 1939, not a good year to be a British animal. No, it really wasn't. So, there is one good thing about Cavani, and that is the fact that he doesn't stay in post for long. He really doesn't once war begins. In fact, he gets replaced by Ricade, who is put in post on the 11th of December, 1940. <sighs> And on paper, should have been an improvement. Should have been an improvement. Really wasn't. Um, Graham Hunter, was it Sinclair that acquired Bletchley Park? It was. Sinclair was the person who set, uh, helped set up Bletchley Park. Frank Swallow, did any spy masters significantly change the outcome of a battle? Hmm... The spy, oh, the spy master. It's the information they managed to get their teams to gather and the situations they managed to put up. I would say Canaris is one, and this is the one I tend to get into. Um, does manage to achieve something quite big because sorry, <sighs> where did you get this from? Where exactly? Not exactly good for you, is it? It's a screw. I thought I policed all those. Where did you find that? Um, Canaris definitely, with the various plots he managed to... Canaris managed to park himself in Neville Chamberlain's brain quite successfully and managed to torment him with ideas of what would happen and various... Du the Dutch, uh, Dutch airfield scare, etc. Um, so, yeah. Canaris... I would say, if anyone has a specific singular battle before a battle is even run. But the rest, it's it's what they're running. It's the information they're getting and how they're getting it and how much information they're bringing and the advice they're bringing. So it's more of a, not so much a battle, but a war. Theirs is a game of a, ma theirs is a marathon, not a sprint. Dan, um, I, Brent. Honestly, Bomber Harry, uh, the tr point I was making, and this is a perfectly legitimate point, is if you start going across these things, you can get into trouble. And as I said, it wasn't the air crews. And in the nicest way, my family was there fighting as well. All over, I lost a lot of family in World War Two. But bombing Dresden. It's an issue. It's not technically a war. Uh, you can't really call it a war crime because they don't set up the Hague and all those things in terms of reference. But it also flirts the line. And the trouble is, once you start going down the line of looking at it, let's say you look at the Soviets or you look at the other ones, you get into trouble. And this is one of the reasons why going back to Donitz, etc., manages to get off when he does. Okay? So that's what we were going on, we were discussing and discussing earlier.
Um, right. <laughs> but no, Riccardo is basically controls the Navy and the Air Ministry and manages to well, not achieve much. Mm, junk or spots as a Soviet meaning way better, uh, uh, maybe better word than commando. Mm. Alan Cox, conspiracy to commit mass murder is a crime. Victors conveniently forget that. Yeah, but it's again, it's it's a war, it's a war issue. Then I should they not have burned Berlin or used a bombs in the Pacific? That saved a lot of lives in the end. I is Truman a war criminal? Well, this is the point, uh, Dan. I it's the case of if you do that, yes, it saves lives. So you can say it's on the balance, it's for, but that doesn't excuse the fact you actually did it. So as a point again, as I made, if you do, if you include that, you then include. It's one reason why the Blitz isn't put in as a war crime, because if you put in the Blitz, you then have to put in the bombing of Germany, and it becomes the equivalency. And then of course the, the uh, nuclear bombs uh, are they a war crime? This is what happens when you're setting up the Nuremberg law, uh, Nure uh, the trials in Nuremberg, and those sort of things. It's not saying they're war criminals. It's saying that the reality is some of the, uh, the decisions they made flirt very, very close with those lines. If you were going on it, and when you're doing the trials, that is what they have happen. Honestly, I think most of the things were justified myself. I'm a bit iffy on the grounds of Dresden because, honestly, there isn't much in Dresden which seems justification other than they're just trying to make a point they can do it. Uh, there are other cities which would have been far more worthy of such attention, in my opinion, but they picked Dresden, and that's that. But no, so, um, Riccardo, well, <sighs> it was June 1941 after for, it took for him to get the Air Force to agree on an aircraft carrier. So six months, even though he's in charge of both at the time, pretty much. He's not chief of staff of the Air Force, but he's in charge of aircraft procurement. And... He doesn't do much. That's the trouble. I can't really render much for Verdict because he doesn't do much. He honestly becomes a bit of a non entity. Hello, M55 Benvids. Wars are nasty, by their very, very nature. Sometimes people are viable in that, some people at the times it's not.
And here is some, of course, some of the added history I was talking about, because uh, one of the problems with all these Italian admirals and um, I noticed they're talking about, you can get the wrong impression, because the chief of staff, who actually is fairly good at his job, isn't in there during war, uh, isn't in there fighting the war on the Axis side for that uh, uh, for long, because he comes in after they declare pe after they start doing peace things. And this can mean you don't pick up on the other admirals. And it's one of the interesting discussions I tend to have with some people who haven't really studied much of the Italian Navy in that all admirals are university bad. And there are a fair number. But I would say, honestly, the worst ones tend to be the political admirals. And there are a fair number of them. But there are a few. Contramago uh, Luigi Masferna is very good. And um, Indigo Campioni. Um, he tries his best. And I would honestly say he could have done a lot better if he'd been pretty much he'd been better equipped. Then I the problem is, as you put the Blitz as an act of aggression, we were fighting a war at a point, and that was the current, uh, current theory. Um, and you have to remember that the British had built a heavy bomber force based on that theory. Uh, that was the entire justification for the Royal Air Force, the idea of bombing enemy cities. Uh, there is a very interesting Italian gentleman who comes up with the theory of basically bo strategic bombing, it's what's the foundation for the Royal Air Force. And originally, the idea put forward by that particular Italian gentleman is that you should use nerve gas and bomb cities and wipe out populations. Now, British never get to that. The Amer uh, Germans never get to that. They try it with high explosive. It's still pretty devastating. And you can say they reap the whirlwind, but in the nicest way, the RAF was the world's largest proponents and most vocal proponents of strategic bombing in the 1920s and 1930s, because that was their justification. And that's why you get these wars of bomber versus battleship, and their entire basis for their fight is the idea of bombing cities. Which, Gilead Duhe has made famous and is the standard pilot strategy at the time. It's not saying they're bad or nasty people. That's saying that was the strategy. That was the thinking at the time. I don't agree with it, but it's the thinking at the time. It doesn't make them bad or good. It means that's the, the thought process. And... There are cities you can uh, you, you can sort of justify bombing, and there are cities you can't. And revenge is not a good way to make strategy. Revenge makes for poor strategy, usually. Manalgar, hello. Not doing much sounds like one of the mo uh, worst condemnations. You can make us someone in charge of a major navy. Pretty much. Um, William Cox, that isn't anonymous. That's actually Wellington. And it's a corruption of what he said was the only thing worse than a battle won is a battle lost. Um, Dan, I, I, they didn't drop the first bomb. Are you sure? <laughs> um. Now, I must admit that the G 
Germans, you can say, attack cities first. But the first British bombing raid on German territory was the 3rd of September 1939. Um, with 18 Hamptons and Vicar, 9 Vickers Wellingtons attacking German warships at Wilhelmshaven. Um, they sort of stay away from cities both sides for a while and then eventually they end up there. Um, and yeah, first are uh, a first raid of. Germany on a British citizen a city was probably 9th of August 1940 with, I would, I think, potentially the um, Birmingham Blitz, but I'm not 100% sure. They might well have hit London before then. I thought they did. But I can't see anything on the list in front of me. And it's a pre pretty accurate list as well. And then the RAF raid Berlin on the 25th of August. So... The proper blitz begin uh, began with on the seventh of September, nineteen forty. Oh well, and Asami Nagano. Um, Anuk, I again, I don't buy that for the Dresden being bombed to inhibit German retreat. Uh, it's not that much of an obstacle bombing a city. And as William Cox says, strategic bombing didn't make the enemy of people lose the will to fight, and it failed. It failed in that promise. Yes. Hello, Vasilis Vergus. Hello. How come both German and Japanese didn't realize that their codes were compromised? Was it a leadership, organization, or cultural failure? Was it a spirit of complex or all of the above? A mixture of all of the above. A mixture of all of the above. Andrew Campbell, Van Vinish now trying to catch in the last 15 minutes of rugby training. Mm, good luck. Trek 001. I've often wondered what the Italians would have flown off their carrier if it had been built. <sighs> Probably one of their fighters. Probably. Um, John Emmett. I've heard conflicting theories of Allied victory. One, the Allies become better at leader. Uh, beca uh, one, because of their uh, better leadership. Two, the Allies won because they had a better leadership system. A mixture of both. Dan, I. The Germans dropped the first bombs in Spain. No, I'm sorry. If you want to go to completely different wars, you've got Japan dropping wars on civilians in China. You have got the British dropping bombs on Arabs uprisings at various points. I I'm I'm sorry, but you've got a you've got the Italians dropping bombs. I'm fairly sure in Somalia and Ethiopia, there are there are a lot of people dropping bombs in you know on groups of civilians. Even World War One has Germans dropping bombs from what are they called? Airships on cities. And the British try and do the same with heavy bombers at various points. This happens. It's been happening for a while. It's not something new which appears in the late 1930s by, uh, by then. As William Cox puts it, co-breaking was an active process. Everyone was doing it all through the war. Sometimes how the non-experts were convinced their codes were unbreakable or were convinced by the scientists they were, because it's mathematically very difficult to break. As Frank Sparta says, there were Nazi generals who purposely did not burn down Paris despite being ordered to do so. Hmm. It's an issue.
Uh, Dana, correct about staying away from, from the cli uh, cities in the beginning. Magic, I should talk about that. I certainly don't want to argue this point with you. So I love your content. Thank you for the saying love comment. And I don't mind discussing the point. It's one of those things. It has to be discussed in nuance. And it's. As I said at the beginning, the world gets far more grey and shades of grey the lower you go down. And yes, there are some very bad people. And there are some people closer to the white line on one side of the pyramid and some people who are actually on the dark line at the, the back line at the other side. If you're going to shade to grey, please note. That's within the shades of grey. And it's not nice. And some terrible things get done in the names of very good reasons. And some very good things get done in the name of terrible reasons at this point. Vision, Germany bombed London with gopher bombers in World War I after Zeppelins got shut down in flames. Yeah. Uh, John, in my Britain opinion, Britain needed little pretext to bomb German cities once their back is against the wall. Once one person who starts doing it, no one's cities were uh, safe in World War II. Nope. Dan, I, my point was Germany perfected as a terror weapon and destroyed huge parts of cities, not comparable to World War I bombing. Uh, again, um, it's, Germany really doesn't perfect it, honestly. The fleets of heavy bombers, they were the um, allied tools. Germany never really has a viable heavy bomber force. So they are doing everything with medium bombers, and you can say they're V weapons or terror weapons, but... Anyway. Asami Nagano, and um, it's him before you get to diets. And he is really an interesting gentleman because he's to take he takes over after the prince, and he is eventually falls from power due to a a, a particular admiral who I don't like in the Japanese. But we might not be getting to him, and he of course says this. Something along those lines. According to the opinion of the Japanese government, if Japan accepts the demands of the United States, Japan will perish. However, even if Japan fights against the United States, Japan may perish. That is, accepting the request of the United States will destroy Japan without fighting the United States. Even if you fight against the United States, if Japan cannot avoid the danger of extinction, Japan defeats it without fighting with the United States, Japanese people will truly disappear from the earth. However, if Japan, Japanese people can fight and show the spirit of defending Japan, in Japan fights against America, our descendants will always rebuild Japan. We hope to solve problems in diplomatic negotiations, but unfortunately we will be fighting if we are to be commanded to, uh, commanded to wage war. Which is rather a sort of complicated way of saying, I don't want war, and war's not good, but if the option is definite loss of survival if we do follow the edicts of America, and the trouble is, you have to remember that some wrote, you know, this is, they're just justifying their victim blaming. And they're not really. They honestly see it as this. That if they don't grow, it, you have to remember it's it's a mercantilist. It's the phrase I'm coming up with a lot, but it's almost a mercantilist worldview of Japan at this point, which is another reason why I worry about other nations right now. In that their view is what they control is the foundation for what will grow Japan. And they unfortunately know Japan's weaknesses all too well. They know her resource weaknesses. They know her uh, population weaknesses. They know her infrastructure weaknesses. And you can say, yes, they should have been doing something about those. And I agree. They thought they were doing something about them. They start off by, as I talked about with them earlier, going for the northern area. Then they find the Soviet Union is rather strong. They find that China is a quagmire, and the Imperial Japanese Army, far from getting glory, is getting a bloody nose. So then it looks south. Because, let's be honest, and this is the point at which I say, you know, let's be honest about them. They are not looking to go east. They're not looking to go east from Japan. And there's a reason they're not looking to go east. Because they're not going to win if they go east against the Americans. They know that. (sighs) 
I don't know, point I was trying to make was the Soviets wanted Dresden bombed. Again, that only has so much influence on things. Congrats. I think the Poles broke the free will enigma mathematically. To an extent, they did. And, yeah. Frank Smart, did a terror weapon ever work as intended? No. I'm not sure I would call the atomic bombs terror weapons. They are weapons of mass destruction, so they bring terror, but they are not terror weapons. Terror weapons are things you're designed to be able to use to intimidate populations. That's the definition of a terror weapon. Hence, terrorists. Nuclear weapons are weapons of mass destruction. They are not terror in that there's not going to be... Uh, the, the thing is, they will destroy the populace. There's not going to be anyone left alive to be terrified. Or if there are, they're not going to be anywhere nearby. Right. Once the Allied leaders have, bomb have the bomber fleets, there is little restriction on using them, aside from the losses inflicted by anti-aircraft fire and Luftwaffe. Yeah. So, this is the trouble for the Japanese. They try to expand. It doesn't work. So they go south. And this is their doctrine. This is what he's involved in. And he's trying to make it work. But again, he's trying to square a circle. And this is the problem for all the Japanese officers involved in this. All of them. They are trying to square circles. Because the reason Japan is going to war is because of their lack of infrastructure, their lack of supplies. If any country needed to have the ability to convert coal into fuel, into oil. Um, it was Japan. If they had had a few of those refineries set up in parts of Japan, they would have had a very different scenario. Yes, their aircraft wouldn't have had the high octane fuel they needed, etc., and all these things to really engage the Americans and Brits one-on-one -on -one when they started turning up. But they'd have had fuel. Yes, they wouldn't have had the best and cleanest of fuels, but they could have designed engines around it or to be able to operate and functions for operating those engines on it. The thing is, they would have had fuel. And if you'd had that fuel, things might change in other areas. Things like the attack on Pearl Harbor could change. And I mean, were the Japanese too greedy? Manchuria could have been an awful lot more productive if they'd stuck with what they got away with before 1934 and developed it. I wouldn't say Japan gets too greedy, but I would say the Japanese army does. They're punch drunk. They think they can get everywhere. They can take everywhere. They think they're invincible. They think the world is theirs. Not coal-powered tanks, but uh, synthetic fuel-powered tanks you could certainly have gone for. The IJ did have tanks. This is one of the things. They, they have these systems. They just don't have enough of them, and they don't have the fuel to really use them properly. And considering how good the Japanese are at building things underground as they demonstrate during the various ba island battles, they could have probably developed, a, a built an entire refinery underground, so it would have been safe from all the bombing. Oh, 
William Cox, Germany borrowed the French gasoline wood burning conversion, even for training school tanks. Hmm. So, key decisions. Well, he decides to go to war. He sends the Kido Batai when Yamato fails to, uh, threatens to resign if he doesn't. Um, but he fails to ensure rigorous war gaming of operations, mainly because he's having to deal with the politics back in high command. And the reaction to submarine warfare, he doesn't push as quickly as he should. And ultimately, his predecessor could have fixed it, but He's both Minister of the Navy prior to, and then Chief of St Imperial Naval General Staff during the war. Therefore, in a nice way, Nagano should have... Um, Nagano should have sorted these things out. He knew about it, he knew there was issues, he needed to do something about it. He needed to set up a generation pipeline that could deal with a longer war. Because at several points he's looking at it, he does think it's going to be a longer war. And Yamato and him you know, are both saying it's going to be a longer war. So they need to, they're need they guilty for not preparing for it. From what I've read anyway, as I said, there is a paucity of sources. And I find some of those sources are scriptive. In that they fit a narrative, which is always worries me. When a source, uh, when a primary source fits a um, narrative far too perfectly, then I get worried. Usually, hmm. usually a primary source, a narrative, a primary sources fit a narrative up to a point. It's usually. I would say, and any good, a, a good, a narrative which is actually drawn from primary sources. Primary sources tend to fit roughly about 70, 75 percent of the time, and therefore you build up the picture. And a narrative is about building up the overall picture. When you have a narrative that isn't that fits it a hundred percent, the fits a primary source fits a narrative a hundred percent, then you worry. Right, on it. Dear Dr. C, is there anything the UK did during the war that you disagree with? Treatment of the Poles and the Finns and various other things. Uh, treatment... of various factions. I can understand the reasoning for invading Iceland and Greenland. I can understand the reasons for those operations, and I support those. I... The British don't really do things which, uh, well, as I said, there is Dresden, which I'm not a... I'm not a fan of. In a nice way, I don't have objections to the bombing campaign, but there are some of the cities which are hit, which I just sit there and go, I don't see the point in this. I actually think it's a waste of bombs. If you're going to do it, yeah, get, do it on cities which are worthwhile. Dresden is it's a pile of wood. It's going to burn. There's no real point for it. But... Broadly speaking, more of what I'm disagreeing with is I think actually the war lasts longer because they, uh, the British, etc., haven't prepared when they really should have. Because the British are, are actually functioning of, of any pad. They're the ones who are predicting war to be the earliest. They're predicting it to be 1942. So they should have been, you would think they would have been slightly more ahead in their preparations. And they've been putting stuff off. And again, it goes back to my decision about sloops and my argument about that. They should have been building more sloops in the interwar years. General William Cox, in Britain, France, the United States, and Germany, large numbers of such generators were constructed or improvised to convert wood and coal into fuel for vehicles. Hmm. But no, he is 
an interesting officer. So verdict. What does he say for Carl Donitz? Honestly, he's far better than Carl Donitz is. <laughs> Asami Nagano is uh, a far better admiral. But in many ways, he's faced with a tougher challenge. Because whereas Donitz is, fa is expected to stop Britain getting resupplied by sea, but possibly not win the war, Nagano is really expected to win the war. Nagano is expected to wipe out the US Navy and win the war. Because, let's be honest, if the Japanese Navy wipe out the American Navy, they expect America to collapse. America wouldn't, but they expect America to collapse. And, as I said, the, that's the whole um, point of the Kantai Kesan, the decisive the battle doctrine, which all the Japanese officers are signed up to. Kantai Kesan, decisive battle, decisive battle, like Toshima, like Trafalgar. Like Mahan has uh, is often marketed as talking about, and Corbett also talks about uh, that. That's all these things are reality, but the trouble is that doesn't happen, and it doesn't happen because he doesn't set it up for it. Because honestly, Pearl Harbor, he should have found more fuel. He could have found more fuel from other operations, um, delayed them a bit, and sent more. You could have sent more carriers. They might not have been as fast, but you could have sent them over there with them. And in you should have been, he should have ensured, Yamato, like Yamato should have ensured that all the strikes were launched, that as many aircraft and as many carriers were sent as could be, and as many strikes were launched as possible, to wipe out as much of the American shipping as possible. You want a Kantai Kesson? Then do the Kantai Kesson, Taranto, and Copenhagen style, because if you actually think about it, decisive battles. The most decisive battle in history was probably Copenhagen's, both of them, because they took out the entire enemy, uh, the entire Danish fleet. So that's a decisive battle that wipes out your enemy, or potential enemy, because really the Danish are kind of like are, are kind of the Napoleonic era version of the Italian navy. They're sitting bestride a very major, important point. Britain in terms of maritime trade, and the worry is they keep getting very, very close to the French. As John Evans points out, bombing campaign did force Germany to devote forces to resources to dealing with the bombers. That is true. And dealing with the effects of bombers. That has a big impact on them. And it should have gone after the dry docks and fuel stocks. Well, they should have gone after lots of things in Pearl Harbor. They should have done a lot of work, a, a, a lot more hitting and a lot more targeting. But they didn't. And so that brings us to Donets. himself. So, Donitz becomes head of the German Navy thanks to Raiders' Fall from Grace. And Raiders' Fall from Grace is not down to anything particularly. It's a long going process. He has lost his touch. He's lost his connection with Hitler. And he's also, he, he's not got any friends at court. He made the decision to stick with Goring and the four year plan to build submarines and ships. And he didn't realize it would all go to Spear way because, well, Goering fell from grace himself. And that undermined him. And, yeah. That's him in a lot of trouble. 
because he can't win. He can't win. Arada can't win the fight. When he tries to hide the extent of losses and various other things from Hitler, he's already set up to lose. And the trouble is, Donitz is too willing to supply all that information to Speer, who then uses it to try and get rid of Rada because Rada is problematic for Speer. And there are lots of people who think Rader is problematic because he keeps arguing, to an extent, logic-based. Which is problematic for them. It's not something they want to see. They don't want to see a logic-based discussion of defence. They want to see um, something which, you know, makes them feel good. That is their problem, arguably. They are obsessed with, you know, hearing good news, not necessarily hearing the truth. And that means at all levels they're starting to do the good news. How often and how well do nations keep their navy at sea to prevent attack and harbour? Mm, there is a reason most navies talk a lot about their ships being at sea. The interesting, that is interesting really what Japanese animals are expected to do compared to German ones. Back to Germany still being land-based power as it always was. To an extent, they don't. <sighs> Raider and Donitz both talk about having 300 submarines as being the ability to win the war. I don't agree with that because I think. Um... <sighs> the problem is. The German analysis of how many submarines you need to build, the, uh, uh, you need to win the war. It sort of presumes that the British Royal Navy stand still, and the Royal Navy is not gonna stand still. They're gonna convoy again. Okay, so you have to deal with counter convoys. Okay, so you've gone for Wolfpack. Okay, how many convoys do you need to take out? Well, let's say you've got wolf packs of 20, escort, or 20 submarines at sea, and you've got, let's say, five uh, wolf packs. Okay, so you can take on five what are certain convoys at a time. But are you going to hit all the convoys at sea? Is every wolf pack going to come into contact with a convoy? No. So let's say you are very successful, 60%. You get three of your wolf packs involved uh, attacking convoys. Right then. So. Are they a fast convoy with fast escorts, which means they're going to get a quick snapshot, but then their convoys are probably going to be zooming past. So they might get a couple of kills, they might not get a lot. Okay, that's not going to really affect the British too much. That, they might lose a ship or two. They will keep going. Okay, so it's the slow convoys. All right. How many submarines are you going to lose the attack? How many to, uh, how many convoys are you going to take out? There is a whole debate on the convoys on the actual impact. I was talked about one of the convoys, which was fuel going across the Atlantic to Gibraltar. And the destructionists, you know, stopped 8th Army working for... Uh, put 8th Army on short rations for a few weeks. 8th Army's fuel didn't come across from America. A little bit did, but not nowhere near much. They have whole refineries sitting in the Middle East, in American ones in Bahrain alone. There are British ones as well in, in, in the Middle East. The fuel, very nicely, is mostly coming through the Indian Ocean, which is why the Germans, the Italians, and the Japanese all put submarines in the Indian Ocean to attack their fuel supply. Ugh. Gonna take uh, the floppy for dinner. I will put his meat on him then.
you like him. Although, I would say he's been making a very committed case for biscuits. Oh, yes. In a chicken oh. pie. Okay, let's put this on. Okay. Okay. Yes, you can say goodbye to everyone. You're lovely. Yes, you're lovely. Go on. Go with your sissy. Go on. Go on. Fluffy research has gone off to get his tea. But you then got escorts, so the British are building escorts for the convoys. And at a certain point, you have the navy going backwards and forwards. You're losing submarines. You're not. Go you're going to be losing submarines to escorts. You it's going to require more than three hundred submarines. And at points in World War II, he has four hundred plus submarines and a hundred and something, hundred and fifty or so operational. But also, he has to have one's operation in the Mediterranean. He has to have one's. He has a hundred and ninety-six submarines operating in the Atlantic. I think it's one hundred ninety-six submarines. Operating in the Atlantic when Operation Torch goes ahead and it doesn't get stopped. It's just. I can understand his logic, his ideas, and I will be talking about who they're based off, but it's based off a fundamental misreading of what that person actually said. Back in a second. Pop to my door again. At some point, I really should sort out my own tea. Anyway, so he has preferences which do describe the uh, do describe the uh, German uh, German carrier uh, German uh, submarine fleet. He is very very forceful in terms of his pursuit of certain types and styles of submarine, and it that has an impact. It has an impact on the shaping of the submarines. It has an impact on the shaping of the fleet. Now, German anyway, Axis planning tended to assume the Allies would not adjust their tactics, production, manpower to compensate. It is an interesting. Um, say that. Sadly enough, that does seem to be mostly true. And there is part of which doesn't really doesn't like that. Um, the thing is, I they do expect the allies to adjust. I think it's not so much they don't expect the allies to adjust; they underestimate the speed of the adjustment. They don't expect the allies to be able to counter as quickly as they do, because in to an extent. The Germans presume that they have an advantage because they are a strong, 
dictatorship, everything's centralized, they can organize these things. They, uh, you know, they are strong. And to an extent, Japan feels that they are a more martial culture than America, so therefore they will stand up more to the rigors. And... And this is the sort of thinking that goes through. But amongst thinking officers, this is understood to be not true. As I see, wasn't the main problem with Donald sending micromanage votes? Lots of radio traffic meant easier detection. Generally didn't learn after all on. That is a very big problem. And as said, I was talking about earlier about the number of packs at sea and the fact that, you know, not everyone's going to find a convoy. One of the easiest ways the Royal Navy and Britain uses for avoiding so avoiding U boats is because they're transmitting. And they hear them. And they avoid them that way. And therefore, they know where they are. Even when they can't crack the code, there's usually enough signals going back and forth they have an idea where they are. This doesn't mean you can't always avoid them because sometimes you having to go a certain route in a certain place because of the weather. And therefore, you can't avoid that. But you can then tell, because of the volume of traffic, which convoy is likely to be hunted in, uh, which the Germans are focusing in on. And when you have enough escorts in service, you, that convoy suddenly goes up. And there are battles when a wolf pack turns up. Why? Yes, we've got, you know, your normal convoy rate, there's about 20, there could be a, a, a 10, a dozen or so escorts. Yes, we can outnumber them. Some of them are looking around going, there's about two dozen escorts here. Where have they all come from? And the thing is, they've been drafted in from the hunter groups and all the other things to reinforce the convoy because the, they worked out that the um, U-boats are coming. And that's the other problem. You know, we talk about the, the, the pack scenario. Yes, this is a problem because it takes two to three the summer, uh, two to three escorts to, to prosecute one submarine. So if you have a dozen escorts, that's six to four to six submarines you can take out, you can sort of take on at any one time. And so if you have a pack of 10 to 20, you're going to overwhelm them. But the trouble is, will all 20 be able to engage at the same time? Possibly not. Will all 20 engage with the same vigor? Possibly not. And what happens if you have 24 escorts? And what happens if they have Hedgehog? And so they only need one or it only needs one or two to engage you. Then suddenly you're fighting a parity war. And the thing is, when a submarine's lost, usually all its crew is lost. When a surface ship is lost, it's annoying, but you can more quickly build one and crew it. How well did Germany and Russia strategically bomb each other? They were trying, but the distances involved are massive. The Russians were trying to bomb the, out of Germany, and but the Ger Russians, the Soviet Union, moved most of their industry back the other side of the Urals, which meant that it was a huge distance for the Germans to cover. Dan Freeman, Don the bait point. Donitz was an over promoted flotilla leader. I can to an extent agree with that one. Um Hello, Shimi. Freeman, was it really in any German planning to fight the UK? I think Donitz was apprehensive about facing the iron. Maybe I'm wrong, I just get a feeling he uh, he rather not of. He was told in 1939 he had till 1948 to prepare. So that's the planning. In January 1939, he's told it's not going to be till 1948. Which is one of the reasons why in September his position, dispositions or his force are quite so terrible.
Frank Spanner, those discussions of war crimes remind too well of plenty of Star Trek DS9 episodes. There were many of those which walked the line. No, I'm working on my Eastern Front essay for comps, and the OKW assure, assumed they were racially, politically, military superior to the Red Army. Uh, they presumed all sorts of weird things. So, Scott, uh, the Kriegsmarine also insisted on ending every message with a certain ten-letter word, to, uh, two-word phrase. It made time breaking the daily rotor settings much easier, as the result was known. Uh, yeah, to be fair, that wasn't... How do I put this? It wasn't every message, but it was a lot of um, Signalman that signed off with that phrase. And Donitz was especially keen on it. Which didn't hurt them. Hmm. Ah, well. So... I think the problem for Donitz is he had... It's one of the interesting things. By the end of World War II, the Germans are producing their submarines in a modular fashion. And that's mostly down to Donitz and Speer, which is some quite smart work. They didn't do that earlier because of, well, reasons. But the point you get to, and the point it sort of becomes a bit weird it's when you start looking at it and go why didn't they assume the allies could do that uh, you know german war plans have no concept of there being something like the liberty ship park ships or victory ships or the various other ones in production they have no concept of that as a reality in their planning and you can understand why to an extent, but if you again look at World War One, the British do start a rapid build program of merchant ships, and they start a rapid build program of escorts. So, surely, surely, when you're making your war plan based on fighting the same in the same style of war again, you should be thinking about that as uh, those are as options. But they don't. They honestly don't. Donitz, one of the good things he does is he transfers U-boat production from Goring to Speer. On the proviso that 40 submarines are provided a month. Now, it never gets to 40. It never gets to 40. But it still gets better than with Goring. He also managed to avoid the destruction of service fleet. And this is something he does. It's one of his few actions where he's acting as head of the German Navy rather than head of the submarine force. And I think he's doing this because he is acting as head of submarine force because he works out very quickly that if you get rid of the surface fleet, you make things a lot easier for the Royal Navy and the Allied navies in terms of fighting the German submarine force because they can get the battleships and the carriers which they have to protect out of the battle. The big fleet carriers, the battleships, battle cruisers, all those things can disappear. They can go off and fight in the Mediterranean against the Italians, but again, the Italians aren't in the war for much longer. So imagine this. Imagine Germany gets rid of its surface fleet, the Italians drop out the war, so you don't have the Italian surface fleet to deal with. You don't have the German surface fleet to deal with. What does the Royal Navy do in 1943? Well, there's going to be a lot of ships heading off to the Pacific fleet, isn't there? A lot of ships. And that is the reality of it. You have, If he got rid of... If he allowed to get rid of that, it would have been a huge win. For the British. So he doesn't do that. But I think that's, again, because he's worried about the, the Allies then being able to focus on the surface threat of the submarines. 
on the subsurface threat and just being able to uh, basically treat the entire Atlantic as one large great big anti-submarine warfare patrol. Dirt Scott, we're not getting into that one. There are so many issues with Goring, or even beyond that. Um, also, in the nicest way, Donitz, any chance he gets, any problem, he tries to blame it on the Italians. Half the time, he thinks the reason that there are any issues which come about because of the British cracking his communications. It's because the Italians have spies selling him out. He's always happy to believe Italians spy spies in Italy and double agents in Italy over the idea that his technology might have been compromised. Ugh. November 1942, there's a high point. Germany sinks 134 ships, or 807,754 tons, including 83 in the Atlantic. Yeah, doesn't do anything, manage to do anything about Operation Torch, the invasion of North Africa. And here is the point again at about him being... Probably goes back to Dan Freeman's point about him being a flotilla leader or going at large. No point does he step back and think, hang on, escort numbers are down on these convoys. Where are all the escorts? He's getting reports. Convoys, they, 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 they have, these convoys are, you know, we're, we're taking a lot of that. There's, there's, there's not many escorts, especially none of the fast escorts around. Where are the fast escorts? Well, I could tell you where the fast escorts were. All the, most of the fast escorts are down with Torch, with the great big invasion fleets for Torch, making sure on, on the orders that Torch will get through no matter what happens. Because you win Torch, you take out North Africa as a campaign theatre. You cut North Africa as a campaign theatre, you start to bottle up Italy. You also make it start possible to almost uh, almost possible to start running convoys through Mediterranean to the Far East and back. Almost, you need to do a little bit more work, work on the Italians before you can do that. But you know, once you've taken Cis North Africa, you can then take Sicily. Once you've taken Sicily, you can then start doing that because if you think about it, you can dodge all the way along the southern coast of the Mediterranean. He was half right when the Italians repeated their signals in the more easily broken code. To an extent. On the 1st of January 1945, though, he does keep fighting. And he has 425 submarines and 144 are operational. And 1st of April 1945, he has 429 with 166 operational. He keeps trying to fight and push his ships out. Pushes his boats out non-stop to win the war. Or rather, stop Germany losing the war. He is committed to the end. Not really keen on them stuff. Tobias Geo3, in semi fairness to Donuts, wouldn't it be logical to assume the Vichy French would defend against Torch and turn in, and in turn they did? It wasn't so much that he expected the Vichy French to, to to defend against Torch. That's not the point. His 196 submarines. His claim prior to World War One, well, prior to World War Two, was that if he had 100 submarines in the North Atlantic, he could stop operations and the Allies and limit their actions. Uh, the largest convoys, pretty much the largest convoys that ever crossed the North Atlantic, are. The, tor uh, the, the torch convoys, they are colossal. They're an entire invasion fleet going across the North Atlantic. And he doesn't touch them. Uh, 
Graham Harmon, really good point. No Turbotech, then USN be really pleased as they're going to have a lot more assists to pound the IJN with, thereby possibly shorter war in the East, potentially. Tobias Jeffrey, also, wouldn't Operation Drumbeat still be in effect, which means most subs are focused on the American East Coast rather than the Caribbean and springboarding to Africa? They were spread throughout. There was some Operation Drumbeat going on, but there are actually a lot more submarines going around than just the ones in Operation Drumbeat. Trust me, not on all 196 are over in uh, in the, on the American coast. In fact, a lot are in the Mid Atlantic, some are in the South Atlantic, some are focused around the Caribbean area. There are a lot of submarines all over the place, uh, over the place, and he doesn't pick it up. I was asking, finding a torch convoy was a matter of pure luck. A sub must have been within a few miles of it. Another point, problem with Donuts. No long-range air reconnaissance. They did have a rec long-range air reconnaissance. It wasn't there wasn't a lot of it, but they had it. There are some very large aircraft which go up searching and things. There's the big condors. Yes, if you take North Africa, you secure skewers, the Middle East oil fields, and the land route to the USR through Iran. All those things. I there were many options for final picture. I did consider one which had. Um, him and Adolf. And I decided that this one was the best picture to end with because in the end this is done it. If anyone promises victory against the British, it's probably done it. If anyone has a potential chance of delivering it, no, it's not done it. No one has really a chance of delivering it from Germany. They don't have the maritime infrastructure to do and deliver it. Uh, if they'd had heavy bombers, they could have probably wreaked more damage. But there again, there's the radars and the fighter networks, so that's not, they're going to lose those. And there's our bombs going back as well. And in the end, it's an infrastructure war, and the British have a lot more infrastructure, maritime, and other things than the Germans do. You know, again, the point I tend to make with the students is that the only fully mechanized, um, fully mechanized, and um, fully motorized and mechanized land army in the world in 1939 is the British Army. It's mishandled quite heavily, but it's there. Other armies haven't. Other armies are still using horsepower. The Germans are still using horsepower the whole way through to World War II. And before someone comes back to me with the chindits and the mules, yes. But that's a specific scenario in India, and it makes sense in the Burma and those some things to use those facilities. Is that Speer behind him? I think so. I think Speer is one of the people behind him. Interesting. Surely the daily reporting position, uh, daily position reporting by the boats, did, aided r routing of really important convoys. It did, which again is on him. Uh, again, that's rather. It's one of the interesting things. I, I, I don't think any convoys were specifically sacrificed for Torch. Uh, I don't think the British went that far. But, although the British and Americans would have gone that far, but I have a, uh, there, there are some convoys which you think if they'd been having uh, a normal load of escorts, they would probably not have suffered like they did. But again, that's something which uh, you would expect an admiral to take back a notice and go, where are all the con escorts? And because that goes on, it's not just one month, okay? To bring Torch together is not a quick process. So there is about six to eight weeks beforehand of those escorts starting to disappear. As they're starting to collect in ports, as they're starting to gather with the convoys, with the invasion fleet and all those formations. And he doesn't pick up on the... He doesn't read the tea leaves. He doesn't pick up on the information coming back. And there are reports going back to him.
But that's donuts for you. Now, I'm going to mention Raphael de Corton because he's going to have a very quick uh, long patrol video for him tomorrow because he is the Italian admiral appointed to take command of the Italian navy when they decide to um, rage a marina, when they decide to go for peace. And he eventually, of course, reaches the famous gentleman's agreement with Andrew Cunningham at Taranto. That's where Cunningham negotiates it and meets with him in Taranto. Where, in many ways, it's arguable the war in the Mediterranean really sort of, uh, 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 to an extent, in the British mindset, takes or uh, begins is Taranto. And it's also where the Italians and the British agree the thing which see is uh, do the gentlemen's agreement which sees the Italians come and operate alongside the Allies. And this is the Japanese Admiral coming up on Saturday. Shikataro Shimera. No. He is, um... <sighs> no, he's just... No. <laughs> he is possibly the worst choice for taking over the post. He uh, engineers the fall of Nagano, and he takes over from him. Mainly because Nagano is arguing so much with Tojo, and Tojo wants control. So Tojo uses the way the progress of the war is to going to kick out the army chief of staff and replace um, take over as chief of staff of the army. So Tojo combines being prime minister with being chief of the imperial army staff. Imperial Japanese Army's general staff, and um, he appoints Shigetaro Shimada as the uh, not just Na Minister of the Navy, but also the Chief of the um, uh, the uh, <coughs> Imperial uh, General Staff of the Imperial Navy and Japanese Navy. In which case, uh, making him Admiralissimo, Supreme. No. <laughs> uh, decision. Nothing like calling someone their bosses underpants to indicate their level of respect. Yep, this is. Those are what the Japanese Navy referred to him as. Um, Amazonski, could a U boat actually be able to count all the escorts and notice that the convoy has less? U range is quite limited. Maybe after engaging, they could find it suddenly easier. Would they report it? Yes, they did report. They did extensive contact reports, which is another reason why the British got so much information about where they were. Um, and they did extensive post when they got back, if they did get back, reports on what they'd seen. So, yes, they had did have the information. Uh, Frank, what may have been Germany's and Japan's best military decision in the war? Well, their best decision would have been not to wage it, but for Japan, probably conducting Pearl Harbor was the only way that they bought themselves the six months. Um... That and the rapid assault on on uh, the going uh, the the just the barefaced aggression of going for Hong Kong uh, going for Hong Kong Singapore and Pearl Harbor in one go, basically doing those as almost simultaneous operations, because that's the only way you stand any chance. For Germany, best decision. Probably the invasion of Norway. Okay, I don't think it should have succeeded. It shouldn't have succeeded by any means. But actually doing it uh, is a massive success for them.
Yes, his quote is completely out of touch, and the, honestly, the episode about him is not very complimentary. Um, he doesn't achieve much as chief of staff, he just gets more failing. And actually, the fact that Tojo appoints him ultimately weakens Tojo and leads to the appointment of Koshira Okua, uh, who had been Minister of the Navy in September 1940 to October 1941, and Chief of the Imperial Japanese Naval General Staff, August 94 to 1945, May 1945, and is a very is probably the best person they've had in that post for years by the time he gets into well and Nagano tried his best but I would say this other guy was actually better than Nagano and he tries his best he really does hard to try but you also have to remember about him is he was passionately of the treaty faction and he was passionately opposed to war with Japan uh, war with America and he tried his best to bring about peace also, hi, where is the fluffy researcher? He's gone off to get his tea. Graham Hanley, in your opinion, Radar or Donitz, and do either compare to Sheer or Hippa? Uh, none obviously came, came near Von Spate. No. Radar and Donitz. <sighs> Honestly, if I was going to pick one of them, if I had, if they were the main two admirals, I had the people I had to choose from to be chief of my naval staff, I'd probably pick Radar over Donitz. Although. I'd make sure that none of his staff officers had travel vouchers. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, Tobias Geoffrey, even with battles in Navik and Luka, can it really be considered naval successes? Uh, they win. Tobias, that's the point. They win in Norway, and having control of Norway causes the Allies immense trouble. If the Germans hadn't had control of Norway, that changes the Battle of Atlantic colossally. That changes the, uh, the changes the Arctic convoys massively, and stops the Allies having to do all sorts of things. Because if you think about it, if Germany doesn't have control of Norway, does Britain need to invade Iceland? No, unless they want them for air bases for the Atl Battle of Atlantic. In which case, they might come with a better way for it. They might invade Iceland still to defend them after, after, of course, Denmark's been taken over. But it might be done in a slightly more slow diplomatic fashion. Um, again, with Greenland and all these sort of things. Norway is a big thing. Ian Strong, I understand the Japanese objective was to knock the USN back hard enough the USN, uh, US would come back to negotiate. That was the aim, although Koshiro Oyukawa, Oyukawa, um his idea was mainly to try and win, uh, to try and keep the Americans as far away from Japan as possible, and he was trying his best, and he did what he could with the resources he had available, and which is why I end up talking about this person, Mitsumasa Yonei. Um, he is a most honourable naval officer, and his his one will come out on the twenty second of September. It's already recorded, programmed in, and set up. And he is an interesting officer because he's minister of the navy, February nineteen thirty seven to August nineteen thirty nine. And when he becomes Prime Minister in January 1940, at the request of Hirohito, he resigns from the Japanese Navy. He's not like Tojo. He doesn't try to be a general and a Prime Minister. or an, He doesn't, isn't an admiral and Prime Minister. He is a Prime Minister. And he tries for peace. He really does try. And in 1944, July, it's seen as a big loss of face to Tojo that Hirohito forces him to have him, the Yonai, come back instead of Tojo's choice as Minister of the Navy. And these are the words which the Hirohito says to Yonai on their last sort of meeting. Um, I really appreciate your duty in, well, not their last sort of meeting, but one of the last meetings before the sort of, as the, as, as the war's over and after Yonai steps sort of down. I really appreciate your duty and effort not to begin the war. I think we are not going to meet often like before. And then the Emperor puts a pen and inkstone into a case and said, 
These are things that I have used. I would like to present this as a gift to you. Now, that is... I, I have put in the video, I have said that's the equivalent of the Queen giving someone their, one of her corgis. That is such a big thing. A big honour. It's a colossal honour for the Emperor to give you something they use themselves. It is There is no higher personal honour. And you have... Uh, Yonai is the head, in many ways, of the Treaty Faction. And he is an incredibly honourable officer. And he does his best. And... There are very few who you can consider quite as important as this gentleman. Also, uh, also with me, would it be better for Journey to focus after 1941 on the Arctic Convoys instead of the Middle Atlantic? Um, not particularly. It would have, uh, uh, let's put it this way, it would have stripped Russia of one supplies, but it would probably just stop the British actually doing the Arctic Convoys. That's the thing. They would give them the excuse for the British not to run the Arctic Convoys. And they have gone great. Because as far as the British were concerned, the Arctic Convoys were done for Stalin's morale effort. If you want actual supplies, try them going through the Pacific and going through Iran. <coughs> right. Um, and, yes, there is a lot of dust in here today because I've been cleaning. I'm not sure if you can see on the camera. Vision. Japan's Longest Day uh, by Toyo Studios is a great film. Admiral Yono plays a key role. Yes, and it's worth watching. It's a really good film. Graham Hanna. Again, your opinion. The, the, the quality officers in the Kriegsmarine was lower than the Kaiserlich Marine by quite some way? I would say the Kaiserlich Marine and the Reichsmarine had better, uh, had better admirals. I would say Raider gets rid of a lot of his good admirals because he's trying to make it fit his ideal of Navy. And I would say that's the trouble is that leaves him with Donuts and a few others. Dean Wong, is it a pen or a brush? It was a pen. It was an uh, inkwell pen, so the sort of the, the drawing pen thing. Diversity or free. That's a very interesting quote. That's basically saying, I'm sorry we didn't listen. Thank you for trying. It is. Dean Wong, I feel you've mistranslated or sourced from a translation. mistranslation. I've got it from the book I've got, and I I I I said this many things. There are examples and discussions around this, but I I have got one decent book which I will do a I'm going to do a review on after this is over, which is in English, and that's from 1992, and that's pretty much the only book you have. And I've tried other sources and other things, but that's the one in the book, and that's also the one on Wikipedia. So I've gone with that translation. There are other translations around. He was key in actually, he pushed, uh, he was pushing a sort of risk fleet strategy prior to war. He wanted Yamato and Mushashi and these sort of things because he saw them as a sort of risk fleet. I.e., if you try and build large numbers of ships, then you are building an aggressive fleet against the Americans and British. But if you build a small number of very powerful ships, then they can't claim to be threatened because they're not outnumbered. But they can claim to be, uh, they uh, can be deterred because they'll think how powerful those ships are. Uh, decision. Japanese calligraphy brush, definitely a hugely significant gift. It, that might well be the case. As said, I would, uh, I, it, I have, hold, I held my hands up. I am significantly at a limit of what I can get. Um, don't try. Doc says, uh, Blazakia. Instead of Blazanka. I said a Blazakia. Blazakia. Uh, my name is pronounced Oshueleski. Oshueleski? Oshueleski. I try. I try. I am sorry. 
I, I do like it sometimes explain to people because of my dyslexia at school I was stopped doing languages at 13 and so that means that anything since 13 uh, a little over 20 years now has been self-taught and self-learning and I'm when I can talk to people I get the accent but when I'm just reading it off it it just counts out bad English and I do apologize for that. I, I, I try my best, but it's just, no, I am. Puzzled. Gary Salsky, an inkstone is used with a fine brush pen. Hmm. Hmm. Anyway, this is the point I would like to make about him. And. On the eight, and I get to this, and I discuss this in great detail in uh, the longer video. But on the eighth of August, nineteen thirty-nine, apparently, at the Five Ministry Commission that was intended to make a plan for potential war. And again, both the book and Wikipedia say this date, and I have a feeling that's possible because the uh, Wikipedia is citing the book. But this is the only book available, so I'm sorry. This is what we're going with. Um, he's asked by Sotaro Ishwati, who has no English language Wikipedia wiki page, and I find that really annoying because he's one of the few finance ministers who doesn't, and he says as finance minister twice, once prior to World War II and once after World War II. Ask you and I, then the Minister of Navy, is it possible for the Imperial Japanese Navy to triumph over America and Britain? This is in 1939, August 1939. And Yone answers, no, the Imperial Japanese Navy is not designed to open fire against them. This is the point. The IGA is designed to deter, IGN is designed to deter conflict with Britain and America. It's a sort of risk fleet deterrent strategy without being the German obsession of building up a certain number. It's, you know, it's sort of a scenario. The Third Reich and the Italian Navy are out of question. So... Someone asked earlier, when did the Japanese, Germans, and Italians know they would lose World War and know, and know that they would never win the World War II? I would argue, in the nicest way, Yunai is predicting it in 1939 and is not completely honest. Chris Ossie, don't worry, no one can pronounce Polish. Thank you. Okay, I'll take your word for it, but a Chinese-Japanese ink brush would be a much better fit for an inkstone. This is the same in China for scholar, gentry, or samurai in Japan. I think you might well be right, but as I said, I have to go with the translation I have. And so that's what I do. I, I, this is the, the rule, as, I, as I've explained to other people. I go with the information I have in a source in front of me I can reference. That's the limitation of an academia. Decision, but if the emperor, yes, but if the emperor is going to give you a gift, he's not giving you his pen. He's giving you the calligraphy brush and inkstone. More than likely, no, possibly, but it's translated as pen, and that's what I've got. So that's what I'm saying. Vision. Japanese did have fountain pens back in the 1940s, so some have been recovered from sunken Iron warships. They had typewriters too. Hmm. It could have been a fountain pen. Uh, I know, I, I think in the nicest way, I think Yonai... Yonai is certainly the closest to the samurai ideal. And there is one good example when there is a bit of a incident. In the, the 26th of February, there is an incident when there are troops rebelling and all sorts of things, and the generals are going, we don't want to call them re rebe rebels and this, uh, you know. <laughs> no, no, because our troops don't rebel. And he basically comes and just goes, I do not support these insurrectionist forces, and I will put them down. And that goes out, and a naval officer stops supporting very quickly, because they're not going to cross him. And many attempts to assassinate him are made, and they come a cropper in various reasons. Like, this is... This is definitely one of the most interesting admirals in terms of his abilities to probably uh, uh, to survive assassination attempts.
Mm. Mm. No, pen would be given an inkwell, not an ink stone. Mm. It's an interesting debate. It really is. And I, as I said, I will dig in further and try my best to find out. Anyway, that is the last slide of tonight's discussions, and I hope you've enjoyed them. I hope you found them interesting. It's certainly been interesting discussing it all with you. Um, I have to say that I have found it very interesting to get hold of this and put this all together. And when I was putting it together, one of the things I did notice very early on was that it was going to require me to buy more books and do work like that. And I have to say, honestly, this has been one of the first really big projects where instead of buying additional works, using the money that comes from the support of the patrons and the super chats and the adverts and all the things. This has been the first project where I've had to almost start from new buying books. Because I had books about the German ones. Of course I did. Because I needed them. Uh, the Italian Chiefs of Staff? Not really. I'd had Italian Admirals, books, but the Italian Chiefs of Staff, no, because they hadn't really featured. And once you start to realize which two of the two who they are during the war, you realize why they don't feature. They frankly don't do much. The Japanese ones were completely out of the ballpark because, and honestly, that's the the, the one book I got is the one book. One of the things you found is that all the books focus on. The Japanese combined fleet commanders, the people at sea, the chiefs of staff get ignored. If you think about it, when you're reading the British and American histories and those things about the history of the British Pacific Fleet and history, the history of Midway and Coral Sea, they're talking about the commander of the combined fleet and his planning. They don't talk about the Minister of the Navy. They don't talk about the chief of the Imperial General of the Imperial General of the General uh, Chief of the uh, uh, Chief of the Imperial Navy's General Staff. They don't. And these are really important people. Andy the Cupid, hello! I guess I missed most of this. Sorry you did. But I hope you like it and there's a lot more coming out. There as, um, the thing I'm going to be announcing today is that's wrong. It's not going to be stopping on the 21st. In fact, they're going to the 23rd, probably, because there's at least a 14th Admiral who I have an idea to put in. Yonai is the 13th Admiral. Decision. Uh, he could have really given his, Yonai his baseball glove. Well, really, when I'm sure, sure, I doubt he would have that. Wrong. Chinese and Japanese use the same kanji Chinese character of a pen and calligraphy brush. I do know that, but as said, I'm having to go with the translation because that's the translation I have. What I have done, again, thanks to all of you, and thanks to your support of Super Chats and those things, is I have managed to get some Japanese sourced works, and I've got a very good friend of mine who's done their PhD in history. And they are going to read the, the things for me and give me translations. And they are a naval historian. They understand Japanese, so they're going to do, do some translating for me. Basically, I bribed them with chocolates. So that's thank you to all of you. Right, any questions? Because I'm going to go in about nine or so minutes. Um, mainly I want to make sure I've answered all the questions and you're all happy. 
but nine soy minutes because I haven't had any, uh, I, I had a snack for lunch, but I'm looking forward to getting some tea. George Newman, hello. About the CNOSG stuff, I know what you mean. I've been reading about World War II in the USN for 30 plus years, and I had to read Webb Griffiths, the Corp series, to find out about Ernest King. Doesn't surprise me. <laughs> it doesn't surprise me at all. Uh, you know, you get into some of the debates, and the amount of people who've told me, oh no, the Royal Navy are a product of this first Sea Lord and that first Sea Lord, and I sit there going, do you have any idea how the Royal Navy's made? The ships are the, the the person who runs the ship procurement is the third Sea Lord, not the first Sea Lord. And yes, the first Sea Lord is the third Sea Lord's boss. But so much is run through that department. Yeah, the, the, the third the first Sea Lord might ha sign off on the big picture, but by the time the detail is produced together, the third Sea Lord could have done whatever they want, really. Frank Spiner, how important are the indecisive battles? Uh, they often tend to lead to changes in command when it's problems. What is your opinion of Operation Keelhaul? Um, kind of, as I said earlier, on my opinion on the what was treated as the uh, of the Finns and the Poles and many others is that I don't like Operation Keel Hall. I I think that. There is a decision made at Yalta Conference which seems sensible on paper, but the reality of the implementation is problematic and very sweeping. It was presumed everyone wanted to go to join home, but it was also presumed to an extent by the Allies that the Soviets would, while setting up nations within their sphere of control, would allow to an extent, extent democracies. It didn't work out on that. Um, it didn't work out like that in any way, shape, or form. And frankly, that is on the Allies, and that is on everyone who made that decision. So, yeah, I'm not a, king, a, a fan of that one. And I think there's a good reason it's given that name. I don't think they were a fan of it at the time. I think they realised after they'd signed up to it what, the, what an issue they'd sign up for. Um, on, in a few join late in a few words. How was Donuts? He was not a good admiral. <laughs> he was probably a good leader of submarines in terms of a flotilla commander, but he he wasn't a good admiral. He wasn't good at strategic thinking and sitting back and trying to come up with an idea and doing that. Um. Graham Hanna, leading on from what you said, any ideas on doing the Admiralty and planning departments at some point? The Casso, uh, one, uh, thanks for doing this. Chocolate is a good character currency, it is. Again, thanks to the very nice, generous people at Patreon and Super Chats and all these things, that's how it's being done. Uh, your take, uh, Old Richard, your take on the Arcus uh, Submarine Dale. Uh, please go check out Bilge Pumps episode 64. You'll find we do a full discussion of it. Have a nice evening, and remember, garden lockdown torpedo bulges. You might skip tea. I had to skip it for a decade. Um, I haven't had lunch, so I will not be skipping tea. Um, but I am working on the torpedo bulges. <laughs> In a nicest way, the moment I 
I'm hoping from next week onwards I can get back to the gym on a regular basis because my gym are starting to open up again. Um, Tian Wong, I'm not sure that the Chi uh, ja uh, the uh, Cubans need nuclear submarines, but the Australians do need to replace their current fleet of submarines, and the trouble is Australia is a lot bigger than Cuba, and therefore they need submarines to provide themselves with their own strategic def de de defense zone. So in the nicest way, nuke subs is probably what it was going to be. As we said in Bill Trump's many times, the Australians are pretty much asking for nuclear subs, but they were trying to buy SSKs, and it just wasn't going to work. So if you're going to object to other nations having nuclear submarines just because they're proximity to you, then you're going to find yourself in a lot of trouble. Because then why are Britain and France both having nuclear submarines? The thing is, you have the nuclear submarines if you need to operate at distances, and the Pacific is by definition at distance. The British and the French have nuclear submarines because they have islands all around the world that they are imp they are responsible for and therefore need to have a, a, a factor for. And also because of operating in the high north. Um, whiskey. Um, uh, when Fisher, uh, Fisher, when he was first Sea Lord, how uh, his real importance was con for construction. Um, he appointed a third Sea Lord who was very supportive of his ideas, and he was very critical to it. In some projects, he did take personal. You have to remember, third Sea Lord tends to have a lot of power on many projects, but battleships from about Fisher onwards, the first Sea Lord takes a very special interest in, so it's more difficult for them to manipulate on that. Which is why Henderson really didn't get his way because he wanted he wanted fifteen inch guns for the uh, King George V and its Chatfield had pushed to fourteen inch. Next one, what is the giant bridge over the Grand Fleet in the Orkneys? Not sure what you're talking about. Um, George Newman, thank you. Well, yes, like thank you for being introduced to me through Dracinafel. I like Dracinafel. Um, I'm not sure what webcam chat is doing in there. Thank you, Dan Freeman, for deleting them. Um... Oh, Venezuela. Tian Wong, again, why was Venezuela getting nuclear submarines? Where, what is the large coastline and the, the large strategic depth they need the nuclear submarines for? Venezuela, if you want to scare... And look, if China wanted to scare America, give Cuba and Venezuela diesel subs. A, they can supply them with fuel, and B, they'd be really freaking scary for the Americans to deal with in those waters. It, the, the, the reason the Australians need nuclear subs is the waters they're in. It, it, the China doesn't need to supply nuke subs. Just send them diesels. They'd be even more worried. Um... Alaski, Japanese fleet commanders, and uh, Nagumi Kondo Tanakan, uh, Tanaka uh, are better known and more successful than Sade Avashada, the chief of staff. I, I'm not so sure. They get a lot of the praise. Uh, including for the stuff their, fleets of, uh, their chiefs of staff do. Note squad, if you officially made it, the adult and bots have hit your channel. <sighs> They've been after my channel for ages. Um, you know I mean? wish I'd been home to see the chat from the beginning. Well, oh, sorry, you weren't. Um, and I'm back on Sunday. There's another uh, there's another question session on Sunday because I'm just uh, I'm dealing with so much weird stuff at home for birthdays and book stuff. Not book as in trial battles and darings. Book as in the edited book. Uh, Rickson, thank you. However, read Donitz's strategy. Was he good at devising a strategy, just not implementing, or not even at that? Not really, because he used someone else's strategy. So, Scott, the French are a bit upset about the cancellation of Collins' replacement subs. Well, um, on that front, as we said in Bilge Pumps, 
The Australian Prime Minister tried to call Macron. Macron dodged his call. And the French were supposed to be delivering submarines over a 10 year, uh, after 10 years, uh, sort of 10 years. They had a 10 year program. Six years into it, they haven't cut any steel. Not a single submarine's been delivered. They're supposed to be hiring thousands of people in Australia. They haven't hired anyone other than PR teams, really, in Australia. Uh, in the nicest way, it's a very long running, a very convoluted project which isn't working out well. So at a certain point, the Australians are going to cut their losses and go, run, and it had to be expected. Uh, but, pardon me, 8829, is Australia, Australia getting US or UK subs? Probably a combination of the two. So because the British don't like selling off systems, but don't mind selling off hulls and, uh, uh, hulls and then design. The Americans don't like selling hulls, but do like a uh, hull design, but do mind, uh, don't mind selling systems. So probably the Australians, Aust Australians will get a hybrid of the two. Christian, I can't wait for the follow-up uh, of Bill Trump's dealing with the ripple effects. Um, it can be interesting, but as I said, today we dealt with the Australian ones in 60, episode 64. In one, Western News Prophecy, UK and France have islands all over the globe, yet we're not allowed to have islands on our own doorstep. No, because you're building them artificially in the South China Sea. Don't take this the wrong way, but you're doing conquest by civil engineering. It's like you did with the Great Wall of China. There's nothing... I that's what China does. There's n that's their strategy, and it's working very well for the moment because no one's really pushing back because it's very difficult to push back at. It's a very clever strategy. But admit it, just it's the same as the Romans did with Hadrian's Wall. It's the same and the Antonine Wall and the various things are the same as you China did the Great Wall. You build civil engineering, you put in these places, and then you claim all the area behind it and so and say you're civilizing it. That is what. That is a strategy which is as old as time, pretty much. Or as old as masonry. Um, and as Derp Squad says, they are SSNs, not SSBNs. They are hunter subs, not ballistic missile subs. And you uh, no way South Korea and Japan aren't seeing what kind of discount naval will off on the um, air reactor tech right now. Um, potentially. I think the Japanese and South Koreans. I think the Japanese might want end up wanting nuclear boats, but nuclear is a big issue in Japan. South Koreans, mm, they for them it's possibly better to go with diesel and have more of them. Frank Spanner, do I see any picture of the Grand Fleet in the Orkneys with the giant fleet of bridge in the background? I'm trying to remember the Grand Fleet in the Orkneys. I'm trying to remember what the bridge is. There is a bridge in the Orkneys. Um, Hmm. I'm not sure. I'll have to look that up. I honestly can't remember. There are lots of pictures of the or, uh, of them in the Firth of Forth with the Forth Bridge in behind them in Scotland, but I'm not, I'm not seeing one in Orkneys. There are various barriers and features in that they sort of the building behind and the church and the stuff at Scarpa flows, uh, stuff at Scarpa flow, various barriers that are built behind them. So that could be what you're talking about. Um, something's called it, sort of the Churchill Barrier. Right. Fourth rail bridge. If it's in the fourth, that's the fourth. Tin Wong, I misunderstood them to be SSBNs. No, they're not. They're nuclear hunter subs. <laughs> um, it's basically in a nice uh, uh, Tin Wong. Uh, it, it's Australia. As we said in Bill Trump many times, they were trying to make a square peg fit a round hole. They they're looking looking at distances of Australia. You either need three squadrons of SSKs to patrol it, 
or you need to buy in nuclear submarines because that's the issue you're dealing with. Um, they're SSNs. Greg Salsi, does China have AIP technology? They do have something on AIP technology, yes. Um, Canada has wanted some. Canada has been an issue. Grand Duke of Mechelen-Soren. Diesel subs can be more stealthy now. Yeah. Andrew Campbell. You never know. It might force the British government to open their checkbook a bit. Thank you, Bishon. The thanks for distracting you from your angry tooth. I'm glad to help. Um, uh, in sorry, a street holds within U.S. and interiors. That's definitely my betting. <laughs> oh. uh, whiskey. Uh, Potion had some uh, subs which stopped uh, to sail from ports because a risk is they uh, swim and submerge. They never emerge again. Hmm. Uh, they're going to be based. Uh, and look, Australian media is concerned they don't have the domestic nuclear industry. They don't, but to be honest, they're going to base it off the British and American nuclear industry to an extent, and they might end up manufacturing a domestic nuclear industry. Dev Squad, I'm wondering if Japan and South Korea will get more aid in helping deploy a SOSA in the South China Sea rather than getting SSNs. Who knows? All sorts of things might happen. Australia will get a Dreadnought submarine. No, they won't get a Dreadnought class. That's an SSBM. They won't get that. Uh, I, I saw a 2018 news report that uh, SK was kicking the tyres on nuclear barracudas. Don't disagree that more SS SKs would be more, uh, probably more helpful. Uh, the thing is, they can't. Uh, they can't afford more SSKs, and so they, uh, you can't it's crew numbers, and in the end, it becomes it's easier to have the SSNs. But it's gonna, it's not gonna be a. It's something a decision they should have probably made five, six years ago. Yeah, I misunderstood the whole thing. I thought the Iron was deploying SSBNs to Australia on a permanent basis in the USN. No, the British and Americans are helping the Australians to get get a hunter killer sub, nuclear hunter killer subs, mainly because Tian Wong. The SSK program for the Barracudas has gone on so long, and the Australians, for political reasons, can't go to the Japanese for SSKs. And the Americans and Brits are only really building nuclear submarines, so the only options we can really give them are nuclear submarines if we help them with that. The Scorpion 26511, it's been a topic in today's episode, episode 64. We actually recorded it today and it went live today. Hmm, vision. I meant Atrus Dreadnought as the first British submarine to an American re uh, reactor in the American sector of the boat. Hmm. It was an interesting time. Anyway. Thank you very much, everyone. I am now well over my time limit. Um, I will thank you for your very kind generosity. Oh, three thirty. Australian sub deal. Right. Take care. Have a nice evening. Uh, thank you. American power plant, British hull, and it goes to dreadnoughts. Mm. It, it, it'll be interesting. It will depend on. Uh, well, I think the uh, I think it might be a fusion of Rolls Royce, etc., other systems. Uh, it might be a Rolls Royce reactor because that tends to require less personnel. Uh, Don Giovanni, how about the SSKs the Brits keep designing and passing on? Um, that would have been an option, but the British haven't built any. Um, if the British have been building some, maybe, but they're not. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.
Take care, TN Wong. Thank you, M35 Ben Bids. Thank you, Juicy Fusion, Derp Squad, Greg Salsi. Thank you, everyone, for watching. Thank you, Dan Freeman, for all your work this evening. And thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.